Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to the CIRAC International Interdisciplinary PhD Student Symposium on Climate Change. I would like to start to I would like to begin by acknowledging that Concordia University is located on unceded indigenous lands. The Kanye Kehaka Nation is recognized as a custodian of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Montreal is historically known as gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it is home to diverse population of indigenous and other people. We respect the continued connection with the past, present and future in our ongoing relationship with indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. Me and my colleagues, Alexander Pacha, where is Alex? Really run. Here is. And Etienne Gertin, here is. We are delighted to welcome you today at our symposium. It is organized by the CIREC. Uh, it is the Center for Interuniversity Research in Quantitative Economics and the Four Space in collaboration with the Departments of Economics, Departments of Geography, Planning and Environment, and Loyola Sustainability Research Center. I want first to start by thanking those of you who traveled to attend the symposium in person, and those of you who joined us online. The symposium brings together distinguished speakers, scientists, and students across Canada and all around the world. It is filled with panel discussions, interactive sessions, and workshops to provide an excellent opportunity to learn more about the ongoing research on climate change across disciplines. The symposium would not have happened today without the immense support from CIREC. The founder and the current director, Professor Emanuela Cardia, who is present here, and the project manager, Sharon Brewer. We truly appreciate all the guidance and encouragement you have provided. Working with you has been such a pleasure. Without further ado, Please welcome Professor Manuela Cardia. Well, I will say something about working with you too at the end. I want to welcome all of you online and in, and in presence. This is a, a very interesting and important gathering of people working on a very, very important topic. I'm an economist, but I believe that we have to work together on climate change uh, from different perspectives. This is a very, very important topic. Very important. Um, sorry. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, um, we need all discipline to approach these problems. Um, so the question is how can we transform society and produce goods for nearly 8 billion of people in the world and yet have growth, economic well-being without um, producing environmental damage? environmentally sustainable growth. I'm an economist. As an economist, we look at things in terms of pricing and, and regulations and externalities. So um, economic growth can generate negative externality. And the negative externality is such that I produce something, I gain, but I don't look at the cost to other people because those costs are zero to me or close to zero or very low. So the response of economy is to say, let's price this and make pay this social cost. Particularly certain costs are invisible to us, although now we're starting to see with microplastic flooding, uh, drought, and, and uh, people starting to even move away from certain areas. But some costs are just not visible to us because they will be paid by the next generation. So it's very hard to convince people that this is a very important thing. I think things are changing a bit late, but they are changing. And um, so in the case of climate change, we are free riding today or have been riding for a long time and we can't afford to do this anymore. 
uh, without regulation, certain inputs to produ production are underpriced, in, and, and we need to do something. Not just on the economic side, that's why it's important we're here together, but also on the technological side, how to produce good without using so much plastic, how to find alternatives to um, carbon emissions. So it's an interdisciplinary effort, and that's why I really welcome this kind of initiative that is interdisciplinary and also like the fact that there are lots of students here that are representative of future generation and the future research. Um, so an economist approach would be to put pricing on emitting carbon, because this is what we do, um, to incentivize business to stop polluting. But in practice, this has not worked very well because we still have carbon emission. Why it hasn't worked well? I think the theory is right, but the point is that it's not just about theory, but how you implement the theory and how high are these prices that we, we, we put, and how these are actually implemented, and whether there are penalties for, for not doing what, uh, for avoiding this, this, uh, this uh, uh, regulations. And particularly, many countries, many companies now produce many goods, and some of these goods are produced in other countries. In fact, many of the goods are produced in other countries. So um we could avoid uh, polluting our country but we're polluting other countries and we produce import goods at uh, low cost from polluting countries and that's just avoiding the problem their own private problem again but inflicting a social cost to society so in other words um, we have to enforce more penalty modify trade agreements not tolerate cheating and this has been and they have and regulation have to be strictly enforced seriously enforced it should not be cheaper to import a good from a polluting country. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has made it more urgent to find alternatives to, um, to the, our dependence to, to brutal dictatorships. So this has become even more pressing on, on a side that we didn't even envision just three months ago. Um, so I, I welcome all of you and I want to say a few words about the center and then thank Ola and the organizers for this, uh, um, organizing this conference. So the center is a center in economics, but it's not, not bad, okay? It's a center in economics. <laughs> um, it was founded in 2002 and has three founding universities. So Concordia is one of the founding universities and University of Montreal and McGill. So it's an inter-university center. And recently we decided to expand our horizon to other disciplines on questions that are of interest to us. So we have a series of interdisciplinary activities, also policy type of activities where we try to, um, on, on subjects, on topics that are of interest of the center, that climate change being one, environmental economics being one, but also health and aging, unemployment, uh, inequality, and the labor markets and education. These are the topics that are central to the center. So we have now a, um, a lot of activities also that are interdisciplinary where we have people exchanging ideas across discipline on the same topic. And this activity is within this kind of new horizon of the center, a new um, uh, mandate of a center. And our activity is always open to everybody upon registration. So you can check our site if you're interested in something else. Um, so I want to give a special thank to the three organizer. I'm going to do a bad job in the last name, some of them, particularly Ola. Thank you, Ola. I can't say your last name very well. <laughs> I tried, <laughs> rehearsed. <laughs> okay, and to Alexandre pa 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 <laughs> very bad, <laughs> and Etienne Gertin. Thank you very much. This is the second time they organized this conference. The first time was online, and this is the first time is hybrid, so it's beautiful to be physically meet all of you, I already met you. Um, I also want to give, so the organization, the program are completely their ideas, and that's also the idea that we experiment. And I really like the, the program. I like the two panel discussion that you have created, very interesting. I thank the panelists for agreeing to participate to this conference. And um, I also want to give a special word of thanks to, to Ola. She is her, it is her who came up with the idea, this idea two years ago and proposed to organize this interdisciplinary event and I really liked it. And then I asked her to organize with other people from other departments so that it's truly an interdisciplinary event. 
And I really hope that we are going to keep this as an annual event. So, you know, we will find new organizer or same organizer or whoever. But I like, uh, I think it's such an important question and such an interdisciplinary matter that uh, it is uh, a truly uh, wonderful to see so many people from different disciplines working together. Um, I also want to thank Jana Franzo from the Department of Communication for organizing the roundtable in communication. I don't know where she is, but thank you. <laughs> and maybe she's online or maybe she'll come later. Um, I want to thank Fort Space for this uh, organizing and for their support. Uh, it was really appreciated. And even more last year, that was completely entirely online. So, um, and I have to thank, um, I mean, many people I probably have to thank and I forget, but I want to thank Sharon Brewer, Brewer who is not here, but she helped organize this conference. She worked with the CIRAC. Again, I hope this will become an annual event and I welcome all of you and I wish you good work and uh, we depend on you for our future. Thanks, bye. <laughs> All right, folks. Thank you so much, Professor Kaidia, for your kind words. We are fortunate to work okay. with you. Um, so this event, as uh, you know already, is uh, in hybrid format. So we applied that format, and we have a pleasure to welcome both in person, to welcome you both in person and online at the same time. This would be impossible with uh, the amazing Four Space team. Anna, Douglas, Carrie, Chanel Lees, Maximus, McKay, and Kiani. Thank you so much for making this task so, so simple. We truly appreciate the way you go about and beyond to make sure the symposium runs smoothly. It is my pleasure to welcome Anna Vaclavek the manager of the Force Space. Anna? All righty, thanks so much, Ola. Um, so I'll just say a few words about uh, where you are and how to engage in the space. So first of all, welcome to Force Space for those of you who are here in person for the first time and those of you joining online, great to see you here. Uh, we're streaming live from the space and what we do here at Force Space is work with Concordia faculty, staff and students to connect people to the research projects, initiatives and the various dialogues and development across Concordia University and with our external colleagues and partners. So we're activated daily with activities and it's our great pleasure to work with this incredible organizing committee here at Concordia who, who pulled these two days of action together. I'll just say a few things um, about participating today. So. You're, if you're in the space, you'll see that there's two screens that you could uh, point your attention to. So feel free to move your chair around to make yourselves comfortable when there's panelists uh, online. You might want to pivot your chair to look at the bigger screen. Otherwise, there's that small screen um, there provided for you and next to the panelists. Those of you joining us via Zoom, hi. I see a few of you have turned on your cameras. You're more than welcome to turn on your camera or keep it off. Obviously, if you're presenting or have something to say, we do encourage you to turn on your camera and raise a virtual hand so that we can call upon you. Uh, otherwise, if you prefer to use the, the chat, it is activated and our moderator, moderators are keeping their eyes on that. We are also live streaming this to YouTube. I'll put the link into the chat in just a second. Otherwise, you can grab it yourself from the top left hand corner where it says live YouTube and I'll show you where the link is uh, if you want to share it across your channels. The final thing to say is some of you um, have come in under um, the wrong name, <laughs> let's put it that way. So feel free to rename yourselves. You should have the power to, to, do so, to do so so that we can identify who's in the space here with us if you came in under somebody else's registration link. Okay, folks, I think that's all the rules of engagement uh, on my end. We wish you a really great day and we'll be here to help out if there is anything. Otherwise, let's get going. Pa panel one, <laughs> over to you. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, lastly, I would like to thank my colleagues, uh, Alex and Etienne, the best teammates ever, believe me. I'm really blessed to work with them. And I'll tell you a small story that last year, when I uh, came out with this idea, I was alone and I was looking for uh, someone to help to organize this uh, amazing event. 
And you won't believe it, but it's ch one chance in a million to find these two guys online without knowing them before. I met them online, we did everything online, and you won't believe it, but we met in person already after the conference. So I was really uh, impressed by their uh, amazing uh, input, and uh, they are really great team teamworks, uh, team, teammates, and it's a great teamwork. Thank you guys so much. And now I'll pass the mic to Etienne. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ola. You're great too. Alex too. Um, so, well, welcome everyone. I'm very happy to see so many people here and I, I can't see people on Zoom, but uh, I'm happy that you're there as well. Um, so I'm just gonna go over the kind of schedule for the next two days. Um, so we have two panel discussions, uh, one every morning at 10 a.m. Today we'll be on the communicating, uh, communication and climate change with three panelists. And tomorrow we're gonna have a panel discussion on the transformation that is or is not necessary to achieve uh, climate mitigation goals with four panelists. We also have every uh, day three blocks of uh, PhD student presentations uh, who do research related on climate change. And at the end of this day, at 3 uh, p.m., we're going to have a workshop on science communication. And at the end of tomorrow, we're going to have a wine and cheese at uh, 3 p.m. for the people who are uh, present in person, of course. Um, about the way we kind of envision this uh, symposium and basically the presentations, we, we are trying to um, diverge a little bit from the usual 10 minute or longer presentations followed by very short question periods and instead what we're uh, we're trying to achieve is more of a discussion between the different disciplines that each touch climate change from a different angle so that's why we have as you will see if you're not aware of it we have very short presentation times uh five minutes per uh phd student and this allows the uh, the thematic uh, presentation block to have about 40 minutes of discussion where we want to really uh, kind of like go beyond the language barrier that often is the issue when you discuss when you talk about the same topics such as climate change but coming from different uh, disciplines and we really want to get to the ideas that are behind the different uh, terms or expressions that are being used between uh, different disciplines. So hopefully that's what we're gonna get uh, in the next two days uh, through the discussions. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Is there anything else? No? Okay, I'm gonna uh, leave the mic to Alex. Thank that's you everyone. Oh, perfect. Um, so not much more to say, but thank you everybody for being here. Um, like Etienne said, Inspired by Force Space, we're trying to do things a bit more interactive, a bit more differently. And so something that we want to try out, it's this program, or rather it's a website called Socrative. And so we'll try to see if this works. Um, if you don't have uh, data or Wi-Fi on your phone, um, there's a guest password for, for here at, uh, at Force Space. Ola, do you mind going to get it? It's just on the on the table over there. And so we'll have you log in afterwards if you need to. But basically, Socrative is a it's a website that allows you to put quizzes up and our surveys and then get answers. So here's oh, 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 okay, you want to um, oh yeah, they'll be able to see it. Yeah. So what we'll do at first is we'll try running a question where everybody can participate. So if you're online, you can participate as well. And it's pretty simple. You just go to um, a website called Socrative. So let me just share my screen so that you can see the details. So if you could go to socrative.com and press on student login. 
and we're all going to log into the same room, which is IPSSCC. So and you should be able to see the question now, which is what word best describes how you feel about the climate crisis? So this is actually a campaign by the Concordia Student Union where they put posters all over campus and it was, I feel blank about the climate crisis. And then they had check marks for all these feelings. Um, and so if you could just, oh, I'm hearing myself there, okay. If you could just, Choose what best describes how you feel, and we'll see what the... what the tally is. I'll give you guys a second to do that. And I mean, this campaign from the CSU is really to promote discussions. Um, and I think that's what we really want to do here, right? We want to get people talking about the climate crisis uh, who have specialties and so we could interact and learn from experts from each other. And it also leads me to our panel discussion today, which um, is going to be starting at 10. but. Just to give you an idea of what it is, is uh, I've had a lot of friends who've come up to me explaining, or as somebody who studies climate science, I'm a paleoclimatologist, so I study tree rings to understand past climate. Um, a lot of people come to me worried and, and asking, Asking how hopeful I am, how, how do I feel, and, and my feelings always change, of course, because the more information you get, the, the harder it is to pin down how you feel because it's so overwhelming. And so today we want to discuss what the climate crisis means um, for communication, how it's communicated, what's the narrative around it, because for the past while it's been quite a negative um, narrative and stressful for a lot of people. Um, so we just want to get some experts in that know about communication, that communicate about science and uh, climate change specifically, and to get that discussion going on the subject to see if we could warm up the conversation on climate change, because it's often so apocalyptic. Um, so, oh. Yeah, we can put the guest Wi-Fi down. So let's just see what our results are for now. Okay. So we got a lot of responses, 31 total. So I'm trying uh, this is uh, a bit confusing for me. Just a second. Let me share. Yeah, so you see it there, yeah, okay. Um, so names for results. Yeah, it's all anonymous, so that's probably good. Um, yeah, yeah, they had the graph earlier, but. Um, that's the first day of <laughs> yeah. holidays. So. Tried it hundreds of times in the CSU. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's just this block for me. Okay, there it is, yeah.
Okay, so we have a lot of A's, a lot of B's, a lot of D's. Um, sorry, let me pull it up because now. <laughs> Yeah, no. Sorry, guys. Um, Yeah, sorry, I'm having some uh, technical difficulties here. That's I'm not on my computer. Yeah, I had it on the on the graph version so that you could see what the actual answers are. But basically, let me pull it up. So we have a lot of, it's too bad we don't have the actual graph, but anyway, there's a lot of anxious, right? B is anxious. <laughs> that, that well, this is the way. I mean, I could go back. Sorry, guys, not the smoothest start. <laughs> but I guess we basically we see that there's a lot of anxiety, right? <laughs> so let, 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 let's just leave it at that and um, let's start our panel discussion and We'll see what the, the panels think. So, what I would suggest is that everyone please grab a coffee and some snacks. And meanwhile, I invite panelists to, to join us here. And maybe Alex, you can. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see, are we connected? Perfect. So let's get started with our first panel titled Warming Up the Climate Conversation. Sorry about the hiccup before. Um, that's what happens when we try <laughs> new things. Um, but what we saw was that there's a lot of anxiety in general. D was the most popular answer. Um, and what we're trying to do here again is sort of see if there's a shift, if we need to shift the climate narrative um, how we could c communicate the climate crisis. And so to do, to discuss that subject, we have three panel members today. Um, we have Kelly McKinney here to my right. Um, she has a MA in psychology, a PhD in anthropology, and is eco, an eco grief and existential coach, activist, and teaches environmental justice, among other subjects, at uh, John Abbott Cal College here in. The Montreal area. And then we have Daniel Horn Greenford, a PhD candidate at Concordia, uh, a published writer, and Richard Zorowski online with us, who is a professional science communicator. Hey, Richard. Um, a politician, a documentarian, a media specialist, and educator. So how we're going to start off the panel today is have you guys answer the question. So what be word best describes how you feel about the climate crisis? Angry, hopeful, skeptical, anxious, apathetic, helpless, or any emotion that you would like to share that's better defining of how you feel. And so how about first we have you uh, introduce yourselves, uh, how your work relates to climate change specifically and climate change communication, and then how you feel about the climate crisis and why. So we'll start off with you, Kelly, please. Okay. All right. Is it on? Okay, can you hear me? Yes? Okay, great. 
Um, well, first of all, I just want to thank the organizers, and I want to thank Alex in particular, who got in touch with me to invite me to this conference. And um, it's really great to be here. And I, um, I think this is just a really important topic. And it's, it's truly um, what we're facing right now is an interdisciplinary issue. So it's nice to have you know, um, people here from multiple disciplines and everything. So thank you. And it was really also nice to ride my bike here and be here in person. Um, I've been on so many online Zoom webinars and conferences and teaching and everything, so um, it's great to be here. Um, okay, so for me, uh, I am very interested in communication because I am a teacher, I am an educator, I'm also a parent of a 17-year-old, I'm a climate activist, and um, I, I do think about all the time um, how to talk to other people, what it means to share our, our, um, our anxieties together, how I can speak to my students. My students are young. They're 17, 18, 19 years old. And their future is really, really bleak. So um, I'm, I'm extremely sensitive to, to how I teach them, um, how I present material, how we process together. And um, because I do have a background in psychology, um, I do feel pretty comfortable um, doing emotional and processing with them. And I've had a little bit of training, um, like the work that reconnects, for example, with um, kind of group uh, processing of our, you know, our, the variety of feelings that, that we all have here. So um, I can just say for me, uh, it was a few years ago that I, I really had this kind of internal shift. Um, I call it the perceptual shift. And it's, yes, of course, I'm, I'm a very educated person. I, I'm, you know, reading constantly. I'm media savvy, et cetera. Um, and so, of course, I've known for, for years that this was happening, okay? But I was always like, oh, yeah, it's happening, the climate and ecological crisis, yeah, the apocalypse, the apocalypse, you know, and I would talk about it. And like, I even thought, should I have my kid, which was like 18 years ago. So it's not like this wasn't in my consciousness, but it really took a long, long time for me to have that switch, which was like, oh, my God, okay? And so I'm very interested in how people make that switch. How does that happen? Where you go from knowing, yeah, kind of, yeah, it sucks. Yeah, I feel anxious. I feel helpless, et cetera. To, to being like, to having this kind of full conscious awareness of the gravity, of the scale, of, of the existential threat, you know? So, um, so I had that. And I can't really say it was, Anything in particular was pre-2018 uh, IPCC, but um, I did join Extinction Rebellion here, and I was already feeling this kind of um, incredible anxiety and sadness and, and anger that, that propelled me to join Extinction Rebellion. So since I don't know what to say. I mean, for me personally, it, it, was a, it was a convergence of many things in my personal life, but it was also the election of Donald Trump that really <laughs> like activated me. I'm American, if you can't tell. So it was like, oh my God, Donald effing Trump? Like, how did this happen? And, you know, a, a colleague of mine died and I was going through some personal stuff. So I was in kind of my own personal existential crisis that was in a context, a political context. So, so anyway, um, here I am. I'm doing a lot of work, a lot of work right now. And I'm still anxious. I still feel incredibly, incredibly sad. I still feel impotent. Um, but I would say the, the, the one emotion that I find really motivating, that's very grounding for me, is anger. And I know that in especially like 
public liberal polite discourse and stuff anger is really you know we're supposed to be civil and everything so i'm not i'm not saying that we you know need to just go out and abuse each other and be totally violent and everything but but i do i would like to make a real pitch for anger here <laughs> um and it's righteous anger it's sacred righteous anger um and so i i harness that and makes me courageous it makes me bold it keeps me going uh so i think sorry i just i'm I, I feel like it, when, when Alex invited me, I was like, well, I'm not really a climate change communicator person, but then I realized I have a lot to say about this. So, um, so I think that, that kind of took care of my first part here. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Kelly. Yeah. I finally got the, the results up. So okay. um, it's seven uh, out of tw 29 that were angry. So you're not alone. Um, right. Let's get that going. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Daniel, if we can move on to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for having me as well, and thanks so much, Kelly, for opening up. Uh, I think Kelly has... We know each other. Yeah, we know each other. <laughs> I definitely know that Kelly has a lot to say about the climate crisis, and um, I think she's definitely a very appropriate person to speak here. So I don't... You're underselling yourself. Um, personally, I'm... I kind of found my place in climate about eight years ago. I was trying to figure out something useful to do um, and something interesting to do for grad school. Um, taking a couple of years out of school, realizing that I wasn't really equipped to do anything in the real world um, that I really wanted to do anyways. So went back to school. Um, and uh, it's been an interesting journey. I've been doing research here at Concordia the whole time for graduate school with Damon Matthews working on stuff like uh, finding ways to ethically share greenhouse gases, mostly re resharing emissions that are embodied in trade. So looking at the ethics of international trade and how to partition um, those greenhouse gases according to a basis of, uh, of need. Um, um, but I did, I've done a lot of stuff on ecological economics, mostly looking at how the service sector isn't really green when you think about how much consumption it induces through high wages. I look at the climate impact of fossil fuel infrastructure and finding ways to actually show that um, new infrastructure isn't compatible with domestic reduction targets or mm -hmm. international commitments. Uh, and I look at other ways for Canada to do its fair share of global climate action. And uh, yeah, so we've been working on a lot of stuff generally in the climate justice and broader ecological uh, research area. And, and as far as feelings go, I guess I, I echo Kelly, I, I feel all these things pretty much all the time. Mm -hmm. um, anxiety and anger, uh, confusion, it's all just, it's, it's essentially you know, the, most, uh, the most complicated and simplest problem of our time and probably any other generation that's, you know, and it makes it the greatest challenge of all. I think, uh, dealing with the climate crisis is, uh, I don't know, it, you, can, you can pick one of a hundred ways to do it every day. Um, but, uh, but like we're gonna talk about later, I think there are, there are a lot of blind spots and we kind of got hung up on things that are not very helpful, which is what I wanna be spending my time on the next, I don't know, I guess decades working in the, working in the field and working on the ground with, with the movement. I'll leave it at that, thank you. Great, thanks Daniel. And now for you, Richard, if you could please share your climate change connection and how you feel about climate crisis in general. Well, Alex, thank you so much and, and your group for including me. Uh, I'm sitting in my office in Halifax and this is my library, my books. Those are all books on climate, crisis. Um, uh, I'll start off with where both Daniel and Kelly have left off. Uh, the emotion that they feel is anger, in addition to many other things. Uh, for me, I, um, I have been dealing directly with the climate impacts for 50 years. I first stumbled into um, the idea of a greenhouse effect when I was an undergraduate at the University of Toronto in 1971, 
studying astrophysics and we were talking about greenhouse effect. And I thought my prof was talking about Venus and he was actually being uh, a little facetious and talking about how he had just read this paper that was put out by one of the oil companies on the greenhouse effect on earth. And he was talking about the need to follow what the club of Rome had been saying. They had published their book in uh, 1972 limits to growth. And I couldn't believe it. Um, you know, as a boomer, I'm 70 years old. So if I start to list the stuff that I've been doing, um, you'll see where my anger comes from. Um, I'm a former city councillor in Halifax, and we were able to get Halifax to declare a climate emergency uh, five years ago when I first started. Evidence-based decision-making, um, that kind of thing. It, it, it's been such a long, torturous process. And when I give talks, I'm a keynote speaker. I've written a number of books on, um, on weather, climate change. I'm a meteorologist. My undergraduate was in math and physics and astrophysics, moving to nuclear physics at the University of Toronto and the University of Windsor. Um, and then I started doing the weather on air for CBC and then started doing uh, science reports, and they always revolved around the environment because that seemed to be becoming larger and larger in, in, a, in how we looked at things. And then I started to become a politically involved. I thought it was easier for me to move into the inside and affect change. Um, and I, it, it didn't seem to work. At first, I was a liberal. <laughs> then I became the Green Party critic for climate change. Uh, then the green renewal. We couldn't get any traction, any synergy in that. I've done documentaries for the Discovery Channel, TV Ontario, ZDF, on climate change, children's shows. Um, I'm a member of the Science Writers and Communicators of Canada on the board of directors, but it seems like we're stuck at about 5%. Mm -hmm. um, that we just don't seem to be able to get past that. Somehow the media, the public perception is not aligned with what we know academically. And what we've been doing, what I've been doing for 50 years has been ineffective. And so I decided to go back to school and I'm a PhD candidate right now, I'll be defending in another month. Um, and my work is in uh, what happens to climate change articles when they get into the media. And uh, I'm looking at uh, media tools to be able to evaluate this. Can Is the media capable of covering climate change or any of the sciences? And so I, my pyramid is a little different because it all funnels into anger. Uh, it started out with, why do I think the way I do and nobody else does? And how can I change that to make people realize that this is an existential crisis that we have. So, um, Daniel, I, I, I don't know what to suggest, but I'll do everything I can to help. And I hope the, this talk helps. Uh, uh, 50 years of frustration is what you're hearing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, wow, yeah, great. <laughs> great ideas, great, great history. Um, so let's move on to the first real question. So the debates in the Canadian election last year and the fall, something that really shocked me was that the Conservatives completely acknowledged climate change. They, they had their own strategies for it. There was no more towing around it. They accepted climate change. And so for me, that signaled a change in the overall narrative that ideologically, at least in Canada, it's completely different in the United States, of course, but uh, there's this acceptance across the ideological spectrum. And then just talking to the average person too, I feel like there's a better understanding of the general impacts. People know uh, that the sea level is gonna rise. People know there's gonna be uh, higher temperatures, more heat waves, um, possible droughts. So that general information I feel has gone through. People know the urgency. And so I guess 
would you agree that we're in a new stage of uh, communicating the climate crisis, of having a new narrative? It's, have we gone beyond this just convincing people, which I would imagine we have? Um, and if so, like what concepts about the climate crisis in this new stage in the in the the twenties in the next decade are important to communicate to the public and important to communicate to institutions other than the purely the impacts and the how important the situation is. Is there something missing in most climate change conversations? Um, Kelly, if we could start with you. Um, yeah, so in in your original question, I was I was just kind of thinking like Yes, we are seeing much more discussion in the media, much more airtime is being given to the crisis. The politicians are kind of talking about it more. But um, yeah, I, there has been a shift, absolutely, in the past few years. But I'm still seeing the dominant discourses seem to be like, uh, there's a lot of greenwashing, there's a lot of techno optimism and what people call soft or new denialism. So it's, it's not that people deny that it's happening at this point um, or that it's not anthropogenically caused, but people are still not acting <laughs> like there is an emergency. So that's, that's what soft denialism is, right? So I think for me, um, I think what's missing here, and I cannot tell you how to get to this point but what's missing here is for leadership, right? To take their roles seriously and take this emergency seriously, right? And so if, the, if our leaders actually want to address this appropriately, I would suggest that they read Seth Klein's book, The Good War. And um, so Seth Klein, I don't know if you all know, but he's, I'm sure he is kind of upsetting that he always has to be known as Naomi's brother, but he is. <laughs> um, and he's a, he's a policy expert and he's an activist and everything. And, and so what he did, he, he looked at World War II and looked at the World War II mobilization here in Canada. Canada did not want to get into the war, okay? And so when they eventually did, there was still lag time of, of really mobilizing and sending troops over to Europe. And so what, what Seth Klein does is he, he really looks at how Canada and, and the leaders in Canada, the prime minister, et cetera, how they mobilize the entire country to basically send, send young men over to Europe to be killed. <laughs> <laughs> and and so, so he did this really great analysis, and out of it, he's he's come up with a, a really um, terrific blueprint that our government could use right now to mobilize. Okay, and these are lessons from history, and and a lot of it's really applicable here. But so one thing that did happen in World War II is that every aspect of society was oriented around the war. Okay, so arts, culture, even the big capitalists, he got them on board. Um, so industry, family life, transport, agriculture, education, right? It was coherent and comprehensive. Now, the, the communication part was very interesting because um, the, the, the leadership, there was, there was an acknowledgement that this is scary, it's really hard, people are gonna die, and huge sacrifices are gonna need to be made by everyone, okay? But, so there was this kind of truthful aspect here, right? It's, it's not like this is fun. It's not like we're just gonna somehow get through this um, not, and everyone's gonna be unscathed. But the other part of the communication that Seth identifies that was really important was a reassuring message from leadership. It's like, we are here, we are taking care of this, okay? We are all in this together. We have a collective, we have solidarity, and no one is going to be left behind. I mean, I'm kind of paraphrasing, that's very you know, contemporary language, right? So the, the social justice component 
is very important in the messaging and in the communication. So, so basically, uh, what Seth was saying, it has to be the communication by our leaders has to be truthful. It has to be honest. Um, the, the elements of sacrifice and uncertainty have to be there. But there also has to be a strong message that we are taking care of business. We have solidarity. It's collective. And we're, we're going to take care. Everyone's going to be taken care of. And we're going to get through this together. OK, so I would like to see some of that happening. Um, so yeah, so you know, obviously, we've already exceeded like, you know, six out of the nine biophysical limits that, that you know, scientists have, have kind of um, described, right? Um, so so I, we're not gonna, we're gonna exceed 1.5 at this point, right? So I think the, the, besides having leadership really kind of get it, its act together and communicate as, in the ways that I've just described, I think the one really big thing missing here, and I know a lot of economists are, would argue with this, it's decroissance, degrowth. That is essential to this conversation. That is going to be absolutely essential to us having a just transition. So I, there was one study saying that, you know, like uh, this generation, um, you all have to like consume 87% less, 87%. Okay, are our leaders talking about that? No. Right? Yes, the decroissance. Yeah, we, yeah, it's the same amount of shows, right? Because it's so radical. Oh, the movement is. Yeah, it is here too, a little bit, but you're not, you're definitely not hearing it from the politicians, so like, as far as I know, there's not a single platform. Um, maybe that, that new platform here in Quebec, what's it called, the climate something? I, I forget. I forget the, the party. Is it QS? Not QS. No. no, it's a new one. What's her name? Is it Martine Wallet, maybe? Anyway, but like if you go on their website, like one of the first things says like the Republic of Quebec, so you know. Um, <laughs> but but that is that's really like the only party that's like really addressing the climate crisis the way it should be. And I don't know if they mentioned de croissants, but Quebec Solidaire is not. So um, so that's that's my contribution <laughs> to what's missing here. Thanks. Thanks, Kelly. Daniel. Sure, I can continue. Yeah, and thanks, Kelly. It's uh, you covered covered at least two of the points I wanted to cover. So I, I know, I'm, I'm glad I'm first. Yeah, yeah you got yeah. it's good. I'm, I don't mind that either. I can just build on that. Yeah. Um, I do, I also am very sympathetic to the war mobilization narrative and uh, an approach, but I think that it's not, it just hasn't really caught on either. I guess it hasn't been that long, maybe five, 10 years. It's been going on longer in the States. People have been pushing for this. Uh, for that metaphor. Yeah, using using yeah. the metaphor and and the research on the historical precedents of wartime scale mobilization mm -hmm. and retooling the economy. Um, so like Lawrence Delina, I believe, was the first to really write comprehensively about this in the States. And Seth has done a, a very good Canadian version of it. Um, but it for you know, and it, it is a really good example of uh, of the government taking the initiative and um, doing what's necessary to actually deal with an existential crisis. The problem is there just doesn't seem to be the political will. Exactly. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll plug something I'm reading at the moment, which is uh, Matthew Huber's um, latest book called Climate Change's Class War, by Vers uh, published by Verso. Mm. And, uh, and he's a big contrarian. He hates degrowth. He hates um, Green New deal stuff to an extent, though likes it as a vehicle. Um, but he makes, uh, he makes some very important points from a very classical Marxist perspective that the New Deal only happened because labor was strong enough to, to get what it demanded mm. by, by having massive, constant disruptions to the economy. Um, this is not what the climate movement has been doing, mm. and it's been very 
what's the word, sheepish mm -hmm. about actually doing anything very disruptive. Mm -hmm. XR, Extinction Rebellion, is, is a very small but good example of disruption, but not, but not full-blown economic disruption that the labor movement is capable of. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a, a, a huge blind spot in climate organizing that Matt Huber is, uh, has made as made the, the the recent part of his career trying to trying to make um can you just give a, a little description of degrowth because i'm not sure everybody okay. knows so, exactly so what degrowth that is. in in a few words is is the call to uh reduce the material and energetic throughput of the economy but in a in a in an equitable way which means mm -hmm. that um which means that the global affluent people in rich countries or rich people anywhere have to reduce the amount that they consume and we need to um, produce things in ways that are more convivial to to respecting ecological limits um, so it is it is very much a, a recognition that we live that our economy is embedded within the wider planetary ecosystem and uh, and that we need to you know build our economy in a way such that it actually fits properly and takes these physical bio biophysical realities into account. So it's uh, it, it does shore up well with with what people believe in ecological economics as well. But uh, it's also a call for kind of collective self limitation. So doing this in a democratic way, coming together and making decisions for how we can actually fairly um, downscale the economic uh, economic activity. Uh, in a way that provisions what we want and what we need, and so we can live really, really well, even better than we do now, but within ego, uh, within biophysical boundaries. Mm -hmm. That's roughly what degrowth is, I guess, to me at least. So it is a very broad movement, and people mm -hmm. have different interpretations, and 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 people outside of the movement tend to grossly mischaracterize what degrowth is, like mm -hmm. call it like uh, I don't know. We should starve the poor because. Uh, because uh, because they don't have anything anyways, why should they matter? Calling for degrowth is essentially calling for uh, asymmetrical development and other kinds of crazy things, which no one in the degrowth community actually is calling for at all. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, yeah, I guess that's that's one of the main points I wanted to make before is that there's there's not a lot of talk about mobilizing labor and mobilizing um, let's say things like general strikes and things that actually disrupt. The economy and business as usual because that's that's the way that the new deal happened and for example uh, in in huber's book he makes the point that the sanders campaign in his opinion failed because they went around they what they went about it backwards they campaigned on a very pro-labor like pro-social campaign but they didn't build the actual labor movement before that existed in the 20s uh, and 20s and 30s and um and, and it's trying to take a shortcut that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So his suggestion roughly is to um, seek out where there already is a lot of good labor infrastructure, unions, and then build on that. Um, and so yeah, he's just taking a, a general building power through labor approach, which I think is, is gonna be a huge important, if not most important kind of way of, uh, of uh, bringing um, political power to heal when uh, when nothing else has really worked to date, so I'll leave it at that. Great! Wow. So, I, I we titled this panel "Warming Up the Climate Conversation," and it's uh, quite quite intense, quite hot to have those ideas of uh, of really a systemic change and having that more in the conversation. Um, R Richard, I'm curious as uh, to where you fit in this. What what do you think is missing from the climate conversation? Do you agree with these more um systemic some would say radical type ideas like degrowth etc i think when when i look at the research i've been doing in the trajectory of my own growth and uh, dealing with the climate change crisis um the glue that binds everything together whether you're talking about politics whether you're talking about actions various groups is the ability to communicate and somehow we have not done that communications effectively. And if we take a look at past political movements, they're all based in, in uh, the ability to communicate, even the ones that we don't like. 
uh, they're able to get a message across that has a synergy to a specific group of people, that is a political motivator. Whether you're talking about um, anti-capitalism or pro-Marxist approaches or anything like that, it appears that the ability to communicate is the key. And the great communicators um, in science have been people like David Suzuki, uh, Carl Sagan, um, uh, Degrassi Ty uh, Tyson um, in, in, in the States, a number of others. We, we had great figures, Albert Einstein in the 50s, able to communicate things that people just didn't understand uh, in, in particular ways. And the, the findings that I see happening is that the glue is there through journalists. And somehow uh, we now have a group of journalists who aren't interested. If you take a look at the position of where the climate change crisis is on a day-to-day -day, uh, news cycle, it's very low. Mm -hmm. Sports, weather, celebrity, all are much, much higher. And, and they're kind of a smorgasbord of communication. So you get different perspectives happening all the time to bolster that. Somehow we have left everything to the scientists to communicate. And of course we communicate well in science, but that doesn't have a synergy with the media. So what we're missing is looking at how the media, and, and we're, we're in a certain sense, we're trying to sta staple jello to the wall because the media is changing so quickly. Um, what was, something that was standard to me in doing documentaries 30 years ago today is something completely different and there are new platforms coming out all the time so um journalists don't use science reports at all um that's what the studies are telling us uh, they get a lot of their information from what other news sources are um doing uh, press releases other uh stations that kind of thing um and journalists use the same method for reporting the sciences as they do sports or politics, even though it's viscerally different. And there are ways to measure how effective uh, your communication is. So th those are not things that we're implement implementing. So I, I, I really think that communications needs to be addressed in order to motivate the politics. Because if you have a message and you can't get it out to the people to make the, 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 the politicians uh, responsible for these things, they're not gonna do anything. In, in council, while I was a city councilor, everybody knew that as soon as I opened my mouth, I was gonna be speaking about the, the climate lens. Whatever decisions we had to do in HRM, Halifax Regional Municipality, had to be viewed through a particular lens and that particular lens wasn't fiscal, in, in my opinion, it was the climate change lens. So we have to modify how science journalism is taught because um, uh, the, the climate change issue is deeply invested in the science. So we, we need to engage with the schools of journalism in turning out journalists that are adept at doing that or engaging different ways of attracting people to the schools of journalism so you can bring in scientists who can learn how to communicate. Because a lot of scientists feel it is not their job to do that. And if we don't do the communications properly, all the other things, that's why Extinction Rebellion is a small group. I mean, they're wonderful people, but they're a very small group. We haven't got the communications down. And I think what we're missing is looking at how we communicate and using that most effectively. And I, and I, I, I think uh, Ke Kelly and Daniel talked about it. The uh, um, various groups did not get their message out, so it didn't have a political synergy. And I think the message is really important. I can go right back to McLuhan on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanna say um, to Daniel, in, in reference to that book, there is a, a coalition right now organizing, we're mobilizing here in Quebec. It's called um, Travailleurs et Travailleurs pour la Justice Climatique. And we are putting pressure on the unions 
we have 1.39 million unionized workers in this province. And so TJC, that's the um, initials, right? TJC, we, we are, we're working on that. Imagine a general strike, imagine a general strike, even better, an unlimited general strike of 1.4 million people. <laughs> We could shut everything down, you know. So, so we're working on that angle. But you know, like with everything, it's. It, I mean, just at my local union, just to get a, a one-day strike, one-day social strike is just. It's almost like beating our heads against wall. But we'll see. We'll see if we vote at the general assembly. But, but I do agree that 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 labor could play an, an enormous role in this. Yeah. Right, so everything we've been discussing sort of leads into the next question of alarm raising narratives and mm -hmm. um, as Richard was saying, the, there's a difficulty in journalists communicating science in general and climate science particularly and there's a lot of resorting to apocalyptic narratives of resorting to um, just anxiety driven narratives that for a lot of youth leads them actually to be either apathetic or sort of paralyzed by their anxiety mm -hmm. and i appreciate the ideas of of having of working through labor and uh that does give some sort of hope through that lens um but i'm wondering <laughs> how do we craft a narrative for the next generation that that's uh, the younger generation that makes them hopeful uh and and gives them agency. And I understand part of that could be through a labor union. I'd love to hear uh, your opinions on that. And should, is there room to leave the pop collective narrative behind and still get all these, uh, all this mobilization without the fear of the apocalypse? Ah, so I should start. Um, it's a really good question. Uh, and so my first little question would be like, who are we talking about when we say we, like who's supposed to be crafting the narrative here? So Richard's talking about, we need more really highly trained journalists who can translate the science in ways that are persuasive and accessible to the general public. Um, but I'm just gonna say, let's just assume that the narrative's gonna be created by maybe people like us to a certain extent, um, people who want the radical systemic transformation that we need, right? Um, so, so, okay, so I, I agree with Richard about like there, there, there does need to be some kind of better connection between science to journalists to the media. Um, I will say that, okay, do you guys, do, does everyone know who Michael Mann is? He's a, yeah, he's a climate scientist. He's like, he's, he's kind of been cast in this role now and he's assumed it too of being like a, a public intellectual and speaking. He's the expert that, that the media always goes to in the US and stuff. And just recently he was, he was really critical of what he called like a doom narrative, right? And so he's, he's kind of been on a little bit of a crusade on the doom narrative against it. But as, with, as we see with the media, the media, of course, picks that up. Oh, you know, the doom narrative and everything. So I'm not sure how helpful that is, but um, yeah, because the way the media runs with things. But, but what I would say about like talking about the doom narrative, um, I, I, I hope that we don't become too distracted by this. I hope we don't become divided in, in, in internally for those of us who are really fighting for change, right? Oh, you're doing the doom narrative. Oh, you're not communicating right. And, and I do think that when we focus too much on, the, on how the, the people who are fighting for change, how we narrate, how we craft the narrative, um, we're, we run in, at the risk of putting so much of the change then whether or not that happens on us, right? So it could be like, you're the problem because you're, you're doing these doom narratives and you're not crafting your narrative, right? Putting it on us who are fighting for change <laughs> rather than the perpetrators of destruction and extinction here, you know? So I would definitely call bullshit on that. And, um, 
And the other part I want to say about the communication here is that um, there is a, Richard, do you, there is a lot of stuff on climate communication though. There's like volumes being written on it now. Yeah, there is. Uh, climate yeah. communications is, uh, a lot of schools are starting to look at how we uh, communicate the science and, uh, yeah. and specifically is the communication of climate change the same as let's say the communication of medical science? Okay. Like, do we have to modify how we approach that? Should we treat it like a, a sports analogy where you have overviews and then you have specific uh, fields of expertise? Mm -hmm. And we're starting to look at, at other ways. And I'll let you finish. Uh, it sort of yeah. leads into what I was going to oh, okay. respond to. So it, it's, okay. it's, a, it's a good in, uh, um, introduction to what I was just going to say. Okay, great. Yeah. And, uh, and um, I mean, I don't know if you're all interested, but the one thing I can speak on um, is really how I communicate as an educator. I don't know if that will be helpful if you would like to hear that, but it's, it's you know, on the ground kind of um, approach that I'm taking. So I do, I teach a climate ethics class. The students are um, in their, usually in their last year of Sage Up and maybe even last semester. So they're a little more mature and everything. And, and so I start the class by, by really kind of laying out the science again, because a lot of people kind of understand, but they don't really understand the science. And there's a, there, there does seem to be some, a, a, to a certain extent, a knowledge gap, just basic knowledge. So I do that. It's, I'm, I'm finding as I'm teaching this for several years now, there, that basic knowledge, the students are coming to class with that now, whereas they weren't just even a few years ago. They didn't know the scale. They didn't know the timeline. They didn't know anything. Um, yeah, so then I lay out the kind of history of deception and lies and like Richard like you were talking about like in the early 70s people were already talking about greenhouse gases I mean there's a whole history of how this has been um, uh, there was a, a scientist um, in the 1860s uh, a woman her last name's foot I mean she was the first one that was doing look, identifying carbon and greenhouse gases right so the you know the fossil fuel industry they had some of the best scientists in the world working on uh, looking at greenhouse gases and CO2 emissions. They knew what was happening. They knew. They, they went and told their bosses and stuff. And the bosses were like, whoa, you know, we, uh-oh. Well, we have to change the narrative. So that was, you know, what we saw in the decades after then was a, a very, very well-funded, very comprehensive campaign that took a play, that took a page out of the tobacco, tobacco company playbook, right? To sow uncertainty, to, um, to just kind of um, downplay the effects, distract people from, from what was really at stake, et cetera. And so I, I tell my, I, I present this material, you know, and then there's also material looking at this whole idea of individual actions, your carbon footprint that was designed by the fossil fuel industry with public relations firms. Okay, again, to deflect attention away from the fossil fuel industry and the banks, et cetera, who are funding them, right? And putting it all on us as individuals. Oh, I'm gonna calculate my individual carbon footprint here. Yeah. It's a great tool to see the extent of the action that is needed mm -hmm. because we know like uh, what the objective is, and therefore with our own carbon footprint, we can know how much we have to, to divide it in order to, to reach the mm -hmm. objective. So I still think it's a great tool and it's an easy tool because you can do it in five minutes just to know where you're at. Mm -hmm. But of course it's not enough and uh, have to do better, but uh, I think it's still a great tool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If we could yeah. we we have only have about ten minutes oh left. Oh my god! So I'm so sorry. That's okay. Uh, okay. So if we could just hear some some thoughts from uh, from Daniel and yeah. Richard before we just ask get a couple yeah. audience questions. Sure. I'll just uh, 
I'll just add a couple of things. I, I definitely agree that better communication is, uh, is necessary, but um, yeah, but there's no, there's no problem with having the, you know, the, the doom narrative, so to speak. I think that people need to understand the gravity of the problem and the situation, mm -hmm. but it tends to, uh, it tends to make people pessimistic if there isn't something constructive they can do. So mm -hmm. any kind of, any, any kind of, you know, serious problem needs to have something you can do, whether or not you know it will work, but something constructive that you can do that brings you together with other people, especially, um, and, and can actually give you some, something, yeah, some constructive outlet. Uh, and that's something that communications is not done well, but also it's something that uh, reporting isn't really designed to do because it's not a flashy, um, it's not a flashy story. And, uh, and it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't evoke the same emotional response as fear and anger. Um, and it doesn't get people to click as much, I imagine either. So, but probably does to an extent, I think. Uh, so yeah, so we need to be able to build these narratives, positive visions of the future and have concrete actions people can take yeah. um, together uh, that can actually help to start to build the world we want mm -hmm. and build power. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's an, you know, that's a discussion in and of itself. But uh, um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Mm -hmm. So if I can, um sort of just summarize, 80% of the population in North America get their climate change and science information from the media. So it, it tells us right away that somehow what the media is doing is having an enormous effect on how we feel about climate change. And if we're not engaged in climate change as a population, then we, it, it's incumbent on us to take a look at how media is constructed. So if we're talking about the doom narrative, that is a natural offshoot of how uh, news is covered. And what we look at uh, in news stories is a one-off story that stands by itself. And the simplest way of doing that is to create a simple narrative. In other words, if I'm talking about automobiles, the simplest, easiest way to look at automobiles is to talk about car crashes. And so when we tend to cover spectacle and we tend to cover those types of narratives, which are easily framed in a one-off story, science doesn't work that way. So here we are, we're a bunch of scientists. We're in, in so many ways, looking at different ways, interdisciplinary ways of framing the science. And it's part of a sequence. It's part of a chain. And it, one thing builds on another and no studies stand by themselves. And so people don't understand anything but the doom narrative because that's what they keep seeing. If people understood the communications of the science to be a continuum, to be something that is um, part of a process, then the understanding of how to deal with it is uh, less assailable by those people who frame things in those narratives. For instance, offloading the responsibility onto the individual. They spend a lot of time, the anti-climate and the climate delayers and the deniers spend a lot of time framing how to unseat the narrative. And the narrative comes from science. And, then, and if, if the population doesn't get that, then the media panders to what works best for them which is the doom scenario. There's nothing wrong with it, but that's a steady diet of chocolate. Um, you, you need your Brussels sprouts someplace. And, and science needs to understand that, how to frame things in the media so that the, the, the population looking at it, because they get the bulk of their information from the media in, in science and their science education. They don't get it academically. So we can, we're speaking to the converted very often if we continue to talk about the process without engaging the media and changing how the media does things. Hey, thank you, Richard. Um, so we have a few minutes for questions. Is there questions from the audience?
Uh, hello, I am uh, Nikola Bilishko from uh, McGill University based on uh, Roger Borskovic Institute in Zagreb, Croatia. And um, um, I'm living for four years for, uh, in, uh, with this uh, uh, climate communication and, uh, and, and I formed the, the initiative uh, scientists for, for, for climate in Croatia. And uh, um, the, I think uh, the people are, uh, are usually very, 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 very biased uh, when receiving the the, the information uh, about about clim climate change. Uh, uh, this is this is uh, this is uh, a scientific fact, but 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 it uh, it it uh, it uh, um, it has uh, much to do with 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 human feelings and and human uh, and 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 our our uh, worldview. And uh, yeah. so, uh, when we co communicate the, sci the science, and uh, especially climate change, uh, we we have to be, be aware that uh, that uh, that uh, people will be will be biased, and 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 uh, and, and then um, the communication of climate change uh, should be uh, must be uh, based on on, on on scientific facts, but. Uh, it it also um, must 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 uh, um, take care about about uh, about uh, uh, the the feelings of of, of the auditory and uh, and also um, IPCC also um, in in its uh, last uh, uh, current uh, um, report. Uh, says that that uh, that we uh, also must uh, take care about 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 uh, not only only on uh, scientific knowledge but but also uh, about traditional knowledge uh, which is uh, which which is um, also very important so thank you for that comment um so we, we have a question online too. Uh, there's communication as verbal or written communication, but what about communication through action? What are we doing that correctly communicates how we should be acting or thinking? Does anybody want to tackle that? Sure, I can try. Yeah. So, so just the, I think that, that it's, there's a careful, there's a careful balance because of course, uh, if I understand the question correctly, uh, our individual actions are are important to an extent, but they're circumscribed within the economy and society we live in today. So, just because somebody flies to a climate conference or uses a mobile phone um, to go on Twitter and talk about the climate or a social revolution doesn't make them a hypocrite. It just mm -hmm. makes them part of the world we live in today and using the tools and participating in the world as it is today. Um, but there are collective actions that actually speak louder than small personal behaviors. Of course, it's good to try to align, um, align your personal behavior as closely to your, to your scientific understanding and your moral, um, and your moral values. But, uh, but then, I think that if people actually started seeing large scale strikes because workers wanted to align their interests with uh, with economic development here um, in the West and saying we don't want to build new fossil fuel infrastructure, we want to build renewable energy infrastructure and stuff like that, that would that would actually make a very salient and material point um, that people would look at and be like, hey, actually, people are talking about a real thing that is happening in the real world. And, uh, and want something to be done about it. So, yeah. Uh, if, if I could also respond, and I think Daniel has raised some interesting points. Um, th there is a, a, a larger overview in this, in that there's a hysteresis effect that people want to have stability and normal. In other words, they want to uh, make sure they have perfect lawns and not put in uh, changes. Uh, for instance, uh, we've been locked down for a couple of years, and one of the reasons that I'm not in Montreal is I'm still hesitant to travel because of COVID. But the Nova Scotia government recently 
um, ask people to start traveling. It said, yours to explore, let's get out there again and bring back the economy. And so there's this government push to go against what the science is telling you and people pick up on that. And, and so um, I think the question is, is, is about individual action. Um, if I go shopping at Costco, I'll see that 70% uh, of people don't wear their masks in spite of the fact that it is recommended that social distancing and masking is an important thing. And the science tells you that we still get affected by what we hear in the media, particularly in very well-crafted ads. Go out and travel, it's your right to travel. Get on that airplane. Um, I choose not to, but that's an individual choice, but many other people don't. People are vacationing again, people are going back to normal. And this is asking something that is not normal and disrupting the stability that we've had for the last 50 to 100 years. Thanks, Richard. If we could just get a final comment from you, Kelly. Oh, I was some closing remarks. Um, close. Are we on closing? Yeah, we're okay. we're, we're running out of time. Okay, so we're, yeah. I have to hurry. Um, <laughs> I I want to say a couple of things here. I didn't really quite finish about my students, but um, I do a lot of emotional processing with them. I know I know a lot about their range of feelings and everything, and their feelings of betrayal and abandonment. Are, are, are quite, quite high. So kind of going along with what Daniel was saying, young people have to see the adults in charge take action. That will mitigate their distress dramatically. Okay, so that's one thing. I wanna talk about hope. Can I talk about hope? Okay. Please. Hope doesn't work for me. There's a lot of definitions of hope. Radical hope, this other kind of hope, blah, blah, blah. Just the word itself, I don't love. But there was one kind of, um, definition of hope that really I was able to grab onto, and it's from um, Maryam Kaba. She's a, a Black American activist, and she talks about hope as a, as a discipline. It's an action. It's a practice. Every single day when you get up and you go and you move forward and you're engaged and you're, you're, you're trying to make the world a better place or you're fighting for change, that's hope. It's in the action itself. Bell Hooks also talks about love. It's not just a feeling, it's an action. So feelings are really important. We gotta talk about them, we gotta process them, we have to give room for them. But, but it's, it's can we talk about emotions as grounded in action too? And the other thing is that um, the word courage for me is my kind of word and I love it. And Kate Marvel, who's a climate scientist, she uses the word courage. And so maybe hope, isn't the word we want to work with, or maybe you have to find your own def definition of hope. But I think it's really important for each of us to kind of find words that make sense to us, that, that empower us, that inspire us, that enliven us, also in, in the actions that we do. So, so for me, it's courage. That's what resonates with me, and that's what kind of keeps me on my path here. And ultimately, I think that we have to act without investment in the outcome. And, and I know that's really hard to do, but if we can kind of mentally put a, ourselves in that space, we must act, right? But we cannot control what's going to happen. Thank you, Kelly. And unfortunately, we have to, to, we have to wrap be. up. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, everybody, for your insightful comments. It, it's Sorry. important discussion, and uh, I, I think we'll just go out with uh, a, a comment in the chat from Bronwyn. We need to provide guidance for meaningful, meaning, meaningful action, otherwise vested interest, interest in preventing social cultural change will fill that gap. And I think these ideas of um, having some different out, uh, approaches in journalism and uh, encouraging labor movements and using that for the climate crisis, I think that provides a room for, for meaningful um, guidance. Mm -hmm. So thank you, everybody. Uh, we're going to take a short break uh, before the first session of PhD presenters. Um, thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Daniel. Thank okay, you, Richard. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thanks. Thank you. All right. Welcome back, everyone. So uh, we are soon going to start our first um, 
PhD presentation uh, block, Grounded Truths. Um, so uh, just a little reminder that um, the presentation should be around five minutes so that we can have time uh, for the discussion period. Um, we are going to start with uh, Mikuria Guye, uh, who's going to talk about indigenous weather forecasting. So uh, Mikuria, I invite you to share your presentation on Zoom. Okay, hello everybody. Hello. We can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, <clears throat> thank you very much. So, in case you are hearing me, uh, yeah, I am Mr. Mokria. I am from Ethiopia. And again, I am PhD candidate in the Department of Geography and Disaster Risk Management with a specialization. Again, I am teaching in Buluhera University, that is also in Ethiopia. So thank you very much for inviting me, uh, because I think you know that Ethiopia is one of the most uh, climate change impacted community, and the people that are highly exposed to the impact of the climate change. So I am working on the drought, specifically my PhD is uh, focused on the, the drought and the pastoral community. So as you can see here, the title is about indigenous weather forecasting. Uh, we are not, we cannot see your presentation right now. Did you, did you share it? Uh, okay, it's, it's not shared so far. I was trying to share in fact. Hmm. Share the screen. Okay. Wait. Yeah. So you, yeah, you press on the share screen button. Oh, okay. Perfect. Now yeah, we can you. see it. Thank you. Uh, it's visible, yes? Yeah, we can see it. Uh, okay, thank you very much. And <clears throat> as you can see from uh, the, uh, the, the title over here, is about indigenous weather forecasting methods among the Guji pastoralists in southern Ethiopia, specifically focusing on how indigenous weather forecasting helps at least the local community towards monitoring the relating drought. So, in fact, uh, as you have been already talking about the, the climate change, in fact, the climate change is not obviously the impact and again, the problem of uh, the developed country. We are seriously facing the challenge. So, because most of the time there is a shift in precipitation temperature that was caused by either naturally or through anthropogenic efforts. In if you see Ethiopia as one of the countries that was located in, in the Eastern Africa, there is obviously a changing of temperature about by 0 0.7 degrees centigrade to 2. Uh, degree centigrade in the last 40 years. So every time in, when we see the history of the climate change and the, the drought in Ethiopia even, that temperature was raised by between 0 0.7 degree centigrade to 2.3 degree centigrade by 2020. And then when you see the climate modeling in Ethiopia, we the, the estimation was there that Ethiopia will face a change of temperature between 0 0.5 to 3.6 degrees centigrade by 2070. This is, uh, in fact, as you see Africa, especially in the northern, uh, the horn of Africa, which Ethiopia is located, then there was a prediction that Ethiopia about uh, 350 to 600 million people will be at risk of uh, water scarcity by 2050. And when we see some 26 or 10 years back, about 2015, there was El Nino induced drought that caused 10.2 million people food insecure. And I'm sorry to interrupt you, uh, Mikuria, but are uh, you 
are you moving your slides forward? Because we're still seeing the first slide of your presentation. Yeah, I am moving forward. Yes. I don't know what the problem is there. I am, in fact, on the sixth slide. You, you would have to go to full screen first. Um, so we can... I, I am moving forward. I don't know what is happening, but... Yeah, we're seeing that there's some kind of failure on your side there. On yeah. Microsoft PowerPoint. Um, are you able to click the full screen button, which is on the bottom right, that little icon uh, yeah. in PowerPoint? I have tried to share, and it's, it says almost if I put if I click some button, it says stop sharing. In that case, maybe I will be out of uh, the mm -hmm. the screen. So if if you click on the bottom right button, just left of the sixty nine percent. Mm -hmm. No, no. Where? At the very bottom of your screen on the right, there is 69%. Mm -hmm. If you click just on the left of that, this should uh, put you in uh, presentation mode. 69. Just, oh, on, okay. just on the left. Just left no, of that, I, yeah. I, I, okay. No, no, so no, I... I, I Okay, it seems like it's not working. So I will I will share your presentation and you tell me uh, which slide to go on. Sorry, everyone, and, about and that. Underlining underlying causes of pastoral challenge in Ethiopia. I think the slide. Okay, we'll just stop your screen share on our end here, and then we'll share it uh, from here. All right. Yeah. In fact, you can give maybe after the presentation to, or you can share there. I can. Okay. So I am I, telling you. I am sharing it here. So uh, please tell me uh, which slide we should uh, be on. Actually, just, just start over. It'll be simpler. Slide five. OK. This one? Mm, wait. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I don't know how I'm going to proceed with that. So yeah, in fact, I will inform you. Then you can, pro you can move the slide. And that way, maybe we can go together. Yeah, um, I, I, please go back at least one slide. Yeah, the, no, yes. no, no, no. Go to the, the the next slide. This one? Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. So uh, when we talk about the history of drought in pastoral community, not only spe specifically to Ethiopia, the, most of the pastoral community in, in Ethiopia, again, in Eastern Africa, they are marginalized either politically or again, environmentally, uh, economically. And however, most of the time they, they lack meteorological stations. And again, the information that they share is very lacking. And again, environmentally, they are located at arid and semi-arid climate zones, but they have still weak access to the climate services. Therefore, they are highly vulnerable to the impacts of the climate change. Uh, and please move the second. Uh, and then because of that, hence the modern method of uh, forecasting the impacts of the climate change is there. They use indigenous weather forecasting methods that for a long period of time, specifically when I come to the point, uh, these people, the Southern Ethiopia, the Guji people use at least three indigenous weather forecasting. The first one is Uchu. Uchu are the individuals or the elders that are highly skilled in reading animal in time, as you can see in the right, uh, the right side. Uh, and again, Ayantos are at what you call maybe developed country. They have their own method, modern method of uh, guessing what is happening by seeing the stars and the moon in the sky. But elders have due knowledge that they use at least to help the community. Other one is the knowledge that used by the, the community as a general, because this kind of community, uh, this kind of knowledge is most often used by the, the entire community so that they can make a decision about the information and the again, impact of the climate change. So uh, please go on. And through that, so there are different indicators. Uh, uh, there are at least two most important indicators. The first one is biological indicators, and the other one is astrological 
in which when we say astrological specifically goes to the ayantos knowledge there are different indicators in biological like maybe how cows urinate, urinate in, in the pral or what you call the, the where they sleep during the night and again how the lake dunks during the night this the birds and again for folk sounds intestine reading which is specifically owned by uchu again the behavior of uh, the insects uh, plants and the flowering plants in their locality and also sometimes the way the animals are urged for sexual uh, uh, feelings so these are all the indicators this is the response that was given by the local community and the percentage was over there and the special characteristics is there maybe so we can talk together after the presentation how they use this to solve the relatively the impacts of the climate change and and by this this is uh, the astrological indicators the, there are astrological indicators this was a figure that was uh, uh, sketched by the uh, Ayantu. So later on, I was converted into a computer. Uh, if, um, so how they use uh, the the locations of uh, stars from the moon or where and when they uh, associate the, um, the, the stars that they used to tell how the fortunes and the mini fortunes of weather related impacts are coming to the community by classifying different stars like Lamy or what you call the binary stars. When they, for example, they see that is happening around the September at 9 p.m. That means the autumn rain is about unlikely not to happen into the area. So Busa is also their plates. If the plates show a bright color, that means in the December, the northern western part of uh, the, their area, that means they say autumn rain is about to rain in the area because autumn is the main raining season in the area. So they associate every um, stars uh, in the sky. But others are also like Sirius, and which they also relate this, this with the how autumn rain will extend or maybe if the year, the early cessation is there or early onset is there so this is also other indicator that they use to to predict and forecast how rain in the game road is about to happen and please go on and by doing this i did i tried to make a comparison between indigenous way of uh, weather forecasting how people use to relate indigenous uh, information with the modern method of um, the weather forecasting, specifically focusing on the drought impacts by calculating the drought incidence using RDI, Reconnaissance Drought Index. So uh, almost as you can see from the figure, maybe in fact, it is not that much very visible, but I tried to calculate and then try to associate uh, how much they are extremely related. So from the figure over here, we have, or oh, I have seen that the, the, the level of understanding or the use of indigenous method of forecasting the drought and the climate weather, weather elements is highly related with indigenous way of predicting things, predicting the impacts or maybe the onset of the drought. That is what the figures or the table over here uh, says. Uh, okay, continue please. And in fact, beyond that, the uh, other. So, sorry yeah. to interrupt you, but uh, you have uh, 30 more seconds. Thank you. Uh, okay. So, there is also a challenge. In fact, in Africa, the most important problem or the most challenging things are even though they are using indigenous weather um, forecasting method, still there are a number of challenges they are facing. So, my, I want to wind up that. It is better if we mainstream the indigenous weather forecasting system into modern method of uh, uh, forecasting climate science so that they can sustain their lives and the livelihood of the pastoral community in Ethiopia. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mikuria. Uh, we're gonna quickly move on to the next presenter, uh, Lucy Liu. So I'm going to share her presentation. Mm -hmm. 
Please go ahead, Lucy. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm happy to continue this discussion on pastoralists and uh, local knowledge. So I also study the rangeland system. My name is Lucy. I am from the Department of Geography from McGill University. And my topic is the impact of property rights on rangeland carbon storage. So a lot, a lot of study has been focusing on forest as a carbon sink. But the interesting thing is that rangelands are important carbon sinks too, mainly because it covers about 30 to 40% of the global ice-free land surface. It also stores a lot of biomass below ground. In my study area, uh, about 92% of the biomass is stored below ground as roots, which is a different as compared to forest which means rangeland is also more adaptable to unstable environment. Basically, when a fire or drought happens, it kills everything on the ground, which in a rangeland system, it's actually not that much as compared to a forest. So my study <coughs> is what factors influence rangeland carbon storage? Um, to answer this question, uh, it was right before COVID, I conducted a um, house of survey and participatory mapping with about 200 herders in um, the China part of the Mongolian Plateau, which is my study area. Um, so basically what I did is to survey each herder and ask them about their parcel boundaries. And through the survey, I can ask them what land management practices uh, that is applied to each parcel. And I also collected social economic data for each herder. And using uh, Google's Earth Engine, which is a cloud-based uh, spatial data platform, I extracted the abiotic data and topographic data of each land parcel. And um, I combined this social data and uh, abiotic data together to answer this question. And what I find is that um, I agreed with uh, most of the literature that abiotic factors such as daily temperature, surface, um, solar radiation, precipitation is very important for arrangement productivity. Uh, land management is obvious, very important too, but uh, I also find out the property rights or land tenure is also important too. I find out that parcel being rented for a short time, which means uh, from one to three years, they are used more intensively as compared to parcels that are owned for a long run. So this is something I find out and um, I I am actually quite excited for the recent years advance in Earth observation data, which means now we have more frequent satellite data on um, monitoring land changes over time, which I think can be utilized for climate change and sustainability research. And my personal interest is to see how this data can be combined with household level um, can be combined with the knowledge of the land users to um, create meaningful questions and create meaningful answers. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll be taking a bit of a step back. So uh, 
we have all heard about the negative impact of livestock on the environment. We know that it's an important contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, that it's a driver of deforestation, uh, biodiversity loss, and the list just goes on. But what if I told you that instead cattle could be part of the solution and help us mitigate climate change and also um, contribute with important ecosystem benefits? Like some of that has been um, mentioned in, by the previous speakers. But I want to bring your attention to how to do this, uh, bringing biodi sorry, to bringing diversity back into agricultural landscapes. So there's several ways to do this. Um, I'll be talking about suitable pastoralism, uh, which is nothing new. It's actually as old as agriculture. And it involves having uh, agricultural landscapes with trees, uh, grasses, shrubs, and livestock added uh, managed under a um, rotational grazing approach. So the benefits of these systems have been extensively studied. Uh, some of them include like they act for carbon sequestration, uh, boost biodiversity, uh, provide higher yields for producers, um, help them to become more resilient to climate change, and they're overall good for the welfare of farm animals as well. The problem here is that adoption of these systems remains slow. So that's what I'm focusing my research on, like finding out what are the challenges uh, among farmers and among stakeholders across the beef value chains uh, to implement these systems? And how can we all together drive the transition towards a more sustainable livestock sector? So my research is set in Mexico, where over half of the territory is used for livestock production. It is the eighth uh, largest producer of beef in the world. And the majority of uh, beef production is done extensively uh, based on monocultures and is characterized by low productivity, uh, degradation, deforestation, and a high dependence on external inputs, which, is, which just makes it all the more relevant that producers uh, transition to more sustainable farming practices. So what I did was uh, started with a document analysis followed by interviews to key stakeholders within and around the beef value chain, and then conducted a workshop, a participatory workshop with stakeholders from the sector uh, that we can see on the screen. And we, what we did was um, create a vision of what a sustainable production entails, like the, all the characteristics, like getting everyone on the same page, and then uh, identifying the challenges to achieve this vision and also um, the role that each of the stakeholders from their different um, sectors could, uh, the role they could play towards uh, facilitating this transition. Some of the findings that we have is um, at the very top, we have in Mexico conflicting public policies. Like there's not, there's a disconnect between the environment as, the, the environment ministry and the agricultural ministry and most of the support towards farmers is in the in the form of uh, agrochemical inputs. so um, there's not much communication there um, also farmers are resistant to change they're risk averse which is perfectly understandable uh, there's the cost for implementation of these systems and we have poorly trained professionals in the area of agroecological management. So they are not able to assist farmers in, this, um, in managing these uh, much more complex systems. However, we can see that there are uh, emerging promising opportunities. First of all, the global concern for climate change has permeated into a stronger, stronger environmental rhetoric uh, in federal policy. We are seeing more intersectoral collaboration between environment, between agriculture, and more program alignment. And most promising of all, we are seeing more multi-stakeholder alliances. We have a lot of uh, international funding agencies, uh, NGOs, a government, and even some participation of the private sector. Uh, one of the examples of these alliances that has been very fruitful is the establishment of field schools uh, around different states in Mexico that adapt uh, the teaching and learning process to the producers' needs. So it is the producers that decide, um, like based on the problematics that they're facing, 
what is to be taught in these field schools that are based on hands-on experience, uh, on pilot farms where producers can actually see the benefits of the systems. And they also help them with the linking to the industry, help them with commercialization to meet the standards that are required by the industry and trying to reduce intermediarism. So um, there's some very promising outcomes and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vivian. We're now going to move to the discussion period. So, so I encourage anyone from the Zoom audience or the in-person audience, if you have questions, don't hesitate. Um, so, do we have any question? Okay, we have a question in the uh, audience, in-person audience. Yeah, thank you very much to all the presenters today for the very um, insightful presentations. Um, Vivian, my question is for you. Um, you, you in this slide, um, you, you also mentioned farmer associativity. So, please, um, what does that mean? Um, sure, it's uh, because of the time constraint. Um, so farmers uh, have very little bargaining power when they're like just by themselves. Like there's a lot of individual individualism in the livestock sector. And it's, this is not only in Mexico, like we've seen it all through Latin America. So in order to access markets, like and avoid intermediarism, which is where all the profits usually stay, like farmers cannot do it because they act as individual units. So that prevents them from getting um, a lot of the support from the from industry actors uh, towards commercializing their products or adopting technologies, getting financing for adopting sustainable technologies that can assist them um, in the in sustainable production. All right. Oh, we have another question from the audience. Um, thank you for all your presentations. And I, I think the work that each of you are doing is really important and could definitely potentially have like really concrete impacts that would be really positive. So I'm just kind of wondering where you see your thesis going after you're done with it. And, and, and just so it doesn't like languish on the library, the virtual library, you know, shelves. So, and also to Makiria, I'm, I'm also curious. He can hear me, right? Yeah, so any, if anyone wants to speak to that, well, feel free to, uh, to start. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a great question for maybe to any PhD student. I, I, I am kind of fortunate because I'm working with uh, Chinese Academy of Science, professor from Chinese Academy of uh, Agricultural Science, who is actually a part of the policy design team. So having the opportunity to working with professors like that um, kind of helped me to knowing more about how to do with policy, how to uh, transfer my study into something that policy makers might be more interesting in. Um, yeah, so that's currently my stage. Um, thank you for the question. Um, same as Lucy, I'm hoping that um, like, working alongside stakeholders in the building of the knowledge that will um, be part of my thesis. I'm really hoping that that can be helpful in informing policy and also contributing for more spaces for stakeholder and multi-stakeholder alliances so that everyone can work together and build on the resource, the different resources that each of the different actors can have uh, towards achieving a sustainable transition.
Thank you, Vivian. Mikuria, uh, would you like to add something on that? Yeah, yeah, sure. I have something to add. In fact, thank you very much for the question. Yeah, in our country, in fact, um, uh, in Ethiopia, we have been facing a number of challenges, specifically when we come to the impacts of the climate change, because uh, the pastoral community, like what I have already mentioned, they are highly marginalized community in terms of uh, economical aspects, environment, and again, they are not taking part in a political decision. At the same time, again, they are the community that are highly lacking well uh, and qualified information from uh, the meteorological centers. So, are they as they far as they are located in very far distance from the centers? They the service they receive from the central government is obviously very low. However, still for a long period of time, they are be using the the indigenous knowledge. So as um, my colleagues are mentioning, uh, one part of uh, the PhD is at least to contribute uh, my side to the science, to the already existing science. And again, we, we are trying to um, at least mainstream indigenous knowledge into uh, at least education or curriculum. Because I am working as uh, um, uh, one of instructors in the university here in Ethiopia, one of the university in very arid location in southern part of Ethiopia. Again, we have been working with different NGOs. In fact, they have been delivering a number of assistance in, in, in the kind of maybe cash, sometimes trainings, and again, in some kind of maybe the, 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 uh, assistance in natural resource management, but that is not able to ensure the sustainable livelihood of the pastoral community. Therefore, as temperature is increasing and the area rainfall is continuously reducing over time, and again, uh, information of climate and the weather elements are very low in the area because of uh, the scarcity of stations related to to the, the climate. Uh, the only option they have is at least at le uh, we have two options, either uh, um, economically helping the pastoral community through delivering information from the center to the local community or re-strengthening the indigenous knowledge of uh, weather forecasting. So now in our case, we are trying our best to mainstream indigenous knowledge into the science so that they can reach the pastoral community through education, through curriculum, through trainings, or again, through um, uh, bringing the, the stations into pastoral community. In my side, I am trying both sides. I don't know which one we are going to uh, do so that it can be helpful to our pastoral community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I think we have a question from the audience, from uh, Hugo Cordo. So Hugo, please go ahead. So thank you. Uh, maybe you cover it in the presentation. So have I arrived midway? So feel free to just tell me I, I said it. So I I think the first time I heard about like carbon negative meat or something like that, um, I, I was really interested, but how can we ensure this is actually the case? I mean, if there, if the price, if there's no price on carbon, I imagine for the agriculture is actually more expensive to do it that way. So how can we like align it? I, I think about like policy, like what we just implemented in Canada. Do you think that could be helpful? Like the, uh, there's like a, uh, a carbon market that literally just got implemented like this week. So maybe to do a bunch on the edge. So uh, great question. So my understanding of this question is that um, basically do we need market incentives specifically uh, some form of carbon tax to uh, make sure that uh, these different uh, approaches to uh, agriculture, uh, raising beef, uh, are actually uh, implemented. Because uh, your question implies that there is an economic incentive not to do that right now, right? It's a bit the hypothesis they have. If people don't do it, I mean, it's probably not the most profitable way. And just to be more precise, I'm, I'm not talking necessarily about the carbon tax. I, I'm talking like there is like a market where you can trade for having credit. Let's say you build like, uh, if you have concrete, you can pay someone that have a forest and you can buy carbon credit. 
I, that would be more the like, type of policy, which is a bit more uh, less harmful than a carbon tax, which I am pretty skeptical can be applied soon in uh, Mexico. Thank you. Uh, would anyone uh, like to respond to that? Yes, Vivian? Thank you for your question. Um, so this is something that's being explored um, and actually it started to be applied in, in Mexico with some of the uh, private actors that are trying to do pilot projects um, um, to incentivize the adoption of silvopastoral systems. It's something uh, complicated to do to measure the, the carbon storage capacity um, of, of the different systems and also like in the long term and that can develop into some sort of greenwashing in my opinion because like for example in the case of silvopastoral systems they associate a lot with um, the forestry industry and if you sell those carbon credits uh, because of all the carbon that's being stored by those trees and those, those trees are used in the forestry industry converted to wood and all uh, well that carbon is released back into the atmosphere, but you already sold those carbon credits. So it's something that's going to be very difficult to regulate. And I would, um, there are other benefits that are more tangible to producers. So I would try to use those to incentivize them to adopt the sustainable practices rather than um, that more like capitalistic approach. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, would any of uh, the two other presenters want to respond to that question? Yeah, I want to add to uh, Vivian's response that um, currently, I think for rangeland specifically, uh, you can see a lot of organizations, they purchase the land. And then um, the criteria is that for you to do some kind of sustainable land management um, as a expense. Um, I, what uh, come to me as Vivian has mentioned is that it's very hard to measure the outcome. So when you're getting paid, um, the organization who paid you wants clearly that they see the result instantly. And this has been very hard for rangeland because rangeland is heavily controlled by precipitation. Uh, you can be, have very high productivity in one year and you can have very low productivity in another year. So what currently happens is that uh, we see this kind of policy or incentives or carbon market that may work in forest system, but in the unstable system such as rangeland, it's still a very big issue scientifically. Thank you. Mikuria, would you have something to say uh, about that? You're muted. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think the, um, the tradition of uh, maybe rangeland management in, in uh, the place where uh, Vivia come in the place where I am living is a bit a little bit very different in our case um, rangeland is managed uh, through indigenous institutions uh, among the pastoral community because in any regions or the community elders there, uh, the, there are individuals who are um, replaced by the community so in case there is a problem related to rangeland degradation or maybe rangeland related problems uh, it is not directly the, the concern of the government it's a concern of the password elders so um, even though i'm not very clear with the question uh, the interest in in pastoral community specifically in ethiopia is um, managed by this uh, so the, the problem over here is now the policy and the government um, uh, highly overlooked uh, the rules or maybe the institutional frameworks that was embedded in pastoral community so that now because of the pressures from the policy pressures from uh, uh, even the globalization in other aspects are uh, contributing to the gradual decline of institutional arrangements and management system uh, so in that case maybe we, we need to at least reconsider in, in policy in ethiopian case 
so that they can have a steel maybe if possible I, I don't know how the politicians will respond to this because in our case things are very difficult in that sense so however the education the the, the educators and again the researchers are more working more over here to at least make an institutional framework of managing rangelands into the policy. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions? We have about another five, ten minutes uh, to wrap up this uh, first uh, presentation block. If we don't, I do have a question. Um, so, it seems to me that the, these three uh, presentations all have in common that they're implied in, in the kind of issues that are being studied is the relationship to the land that the people that farm uh, in, in different ways, pastoralists, uh, farmers, uh, people that uh, raise beef, they, it seems to me that the relationship to the land is important in the sense that for the pastoralists, getting to know uh, the different animals uh, that live around helps uh, forecasting weather and then uh, contributes to the resilience of this uh, way of, uh, of uh, farming. And the same thing I think applies to uh, the, how do you call it, the civil pastoralism which in the sense that if you uh, understand how biodiversity and the complexity of uh, the system helps the resilience, then it's, it, it's an important thing. And also the same uh, applies in a way to um, the, the rented uh, versus privately owned parcels in the sense that if you uh, own your parcel, it seems that you have maybe a sense of belonging to it and you will care more for it. So I was curious to know if uh, you have anything to say about that in terms of how people relate to the land and how does this influence the sustainability of practices. And if you agree with that and if there are any um, systemic um, obstacles to that or ways to promote that. and. Uh, yeah, so if everyone could uh, speak to that for uh, one or two minutes, we're going to wrap up with that. Thank you. I can go, go first. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, one obstacle to that like sense of belonging with the land, as you mentioned, and that is very important, is how agriculture has become more and more specialized and industrialized. And there's like this disconnect between how like the biolog biological cycles of like <laughs> carbon and nitrogen and all of that, how that nurtures the land and how every um, biotic element like the plants and the animals have a role to play. Uh, but that's not the case anymore in most agricultural models. Uh, so, that are industrial that require a lot of external inputs and just break uh, the cycle. So one thing that we found from like all the interviews uh, that I've been conducting uh, with farmers is that the ones that actually like understand this or have this interest in nature and to just like sit down and see like all the, the other biodiversity apart from, from their own um, livestock like and really take the time to understand and see how uh, yeah, like yeah every actor in nature has a role to play uh, for the land to be more productive those are the ones that are willing to to take the risk to try new management practices and even though there can be more complex like it requires a lot more knowledge to manage these kinds of systems where you have to like know about the trees and then like insects and and you don't just use herbicides and pesticides to control everything that you don't like. So those, like that connection to nature is what really drives producers to try to, to do this. And since we cannot depend on that because it's their livelihoods that's at play, I think it's up to like um, the financing, finance, financing agencies, investors, the government to actually give the 
the tools to producers to do this change and knowing that they have like a backup, um, like that they won't, like when things go wrong, when there's still this learning curve, uh, that they will still be like able to, to have a livelihood. Thank you. Uh, Lucy or Mercuria, would you like to uh, speak on that? Go ahead, Lucy. Yeah. So I think what I learned m most about doing my research with the herders is to see their kind of adaptation to climate change or to environmental change in general, which is something if I don't talk to the herders and I only look at the literature, you can, it's very easy to see a black and white um, picture of pastoral livelihood. It's either uh, herders are exhausted, are um, hurted by the climate change, by the environmental and social changes. Uh, mostly you just see the story in the negative side, but um, when I talk to herders face to face, I figure out they come up with a lot of strategies um, to these environmental and social disturbances, which I, in fact, learned a lot. Say, if a drought happens or if herders are no longer able to migrate, they can come up with other strategies such as pur purchasing fodder or using their own network to solve this problem. So um, I think that's something I find very interesting, which also informs me to think more about the changing environmental issues is the adaptation. Uh, that's what I learned from how their relationship to land. Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, Mikuria, would you like to end uh, with a word on that? Yeah, <clears throat> to, to add at least a very few. Um, uh, the, the issue of land and the pastoral relationship is uh, very serious in, in my locality or in the place where we are. <clears throat> um, in fact, uh, in Ethiopia, um, the land, the, the rule of the country say that land is the common property uh, and it belongs to even the state, even though it's uh, uh, common property. The, 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 the one who rules or who gives right to use the resource of the, 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 the environment is government. However, in pastoral community, there is a dilemma if they are using the land by their own institutional way of leading and again managing the resource on the environment or if they are abide by the law that is centrally formulated by the government. Very recently, government tried to bring into effect the land certification, but that that's also had its own another problem because when you give land certification in pastoral community pastoralists are not uh, said that they are not living sedentary way of life because then they move from one area to the another in search of water in search of pasture so mobility is a, a very common phenomena in pastoral um, area so when you give a certification by other means you are restricting the mobility because as you give certification to the pastoralists at household level that they, they they think that the, the area was, that was the certification was given was belongs to uh, an individual so in that case restricting pastoral mobility is also another problem because uh, as a drought and other climate um, events and the climate shocks are increasing over time when you restrict the mobility they are not they have no any chance like what is happening even this year 2022 uh, there are more than three million cows was died and almost more than 40 million people are stopped because when you restrict the mobility they are not able to move to search water and pasture so that the issue of land is also another bone of contention in the and again in my study area. That is what I am <clears throat> trying to frame out. Thank you. Thank you, Mercuria. Uh, thanks to our three presenters for this uh, great first uh, presentation block. Uh, it's now past 12.15, so we're gonna, um, we're gonna move to the lunch uh, break, which uh, will 
And we will resume uh, with another presentation block at 1 p.m. For the people who are online, uh, I invite you to uh, go to the, the Wonder uh, virtual uh, room where uh, you can uh, chit chat with other uh, virtual attendees. And uh, for the in-person uh, attendees, we are having lunch now. So that's it. And I'll see the online people again at 1 p.m. Thank you, everyone. So welcome back, everybody. We're at our second se session called Crisis Culture. And so this is actually going to dip in back to the panel discussion we had this morning. Um, we'll be talking about climate change communication, um, apocalyptic thinking, and climate change denial as well. So we're going to start off. Um, can you, Makai, am I on the screen? Yeah, OK. OK, so we'll, we'll start off with uh, Carolyn Eckert from Department of English Language and Literature at University of Waterloo. Um, with the title Ethos in Millennial and Gen Z Climate Communications. Um, are you there, Carolyn? I am here. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we can. Perfect. You can go ahead. All right. Thank you very much for allowing me to share some of the research and research project that I've been part of over the last year. Uh, in terms of what I want to cover today, a little bit of background around our research and our work with a survey, and then sort of explain how that dovetails into uh, some of the research that I'm doing as well, and what opportunities that I really see in terms of interdisciplinary around collaborating. And then I've got a couple of questions for our discussion that I hope are, are going to be um, something to get us started. But I wanted to give a little bit of an explanation about my background. So rhetoric is an important field of study for examining the success of a speaker with an audience in persuasive communications. Aristotle, a Greek philosopher from the classical period in ancient Greece, defined rhetoric as the art of discovering the means of persuasion available for any occasion. Discovering or inventing arguments involves an appeal to reason or logos, an emotional appeal, pathos, and ethos, which is an appeal to authority, legitimacy, credibility, and trust in the speaker's character. Aristotle positioned the work of ethos in the art of rhetorical argument to be more than just simply moral and ethical practice or even reputation of the speaker. He focused his attention on the performance of character as the controlling factor in persuading an audience. This artistic view or active construction of character, if done well, inspires trust. Trust in science is based in ethos and the qualities of trust, trustworthiness, credence and credibility are key aspects for establishing a speaker's ethos or moral character and for gaining the trust of the audience. Aristotle's concept of ethos where we trust those in whom we sense goodwill, appropriate moral qualities and knowledge that can be applied to our problems helps us determine who we can trust and who we may consider as an expert. Expertise and how it is instituted and negotiated is often defined by the participants and their strategies, all competing for authority and legitimacy. Credibility, legitimacy, or authority of an expert is shaped by the expert possessing a particular kind of knowledge and on the public's recognition that they possess it. However, the diversity of sustainability and complexity of climate change has contributed to a vast expert field prompting multiple views, challenges, and even misdisinformation that leads to concerns about who is an expert or who even has authority or legitimacy to be a trusted source. The intricacy of trans-scientific genres or emerging forms of science communication and how science is communicated between professional and popular discourses further highlights some of the challenges to expertise and expert status. So this kind of brings us to our problem, not in the really a problem, but young people. So Gen Y or looking at millennials born between 1984 and 96, and even Gen Z born after 97, we know that they're highly engaged in uh, climate change and action, and obviously are adept with technical and rhetorical resources, both online and digital. 
but their credibility and authority for speaking and engaging on climate action or issues are often challenged by political media and public barriers, which really limits their legitimacy to participate in some of these politicized scientific issues. At the same time, climate anxiety is high among youth in reaction to unprecedented climate events and the reporting of those events, noting the imminent nature of the climate crisis that they will inherit. The anxiety and fear are real and are extended by the fact that they are largely left out of the conversations and left with no real sense of being able to take action towards any real change. This study examines Canadian youth participation and engagement in climate change appeals and how their unique perspective through appeals to practical hope and fear might help shape the ethical horizons for climate action. Indeed, youth along with emotional appeals and effective experiences have much to tell us about the ethical world we inhabit and how we can reimagine our climate future. So we conducted a survey of Canadians to better understand communication practices around climate communication. In addition to quantitative data, we collected open-ended responses providing qualitative data. Currently, we're quoting that data and we'll be publishing our findings over the next year, but initially we can report that there are a range of strategies that people report using, including some that appear to be at odds with one another. So we know that some people tell us that it is important to just use the science. Others tell us that it is important to relate issues of justice or connect these to values. And rhetorically, we can see this may be context specific, but in our initial impressions, it looks as though it's important to learn more about what strategies people are currently using when we give advice about how to most effectively communicate about this subject. So looking at ways that people are currently talking or giving advice and how we can learn uh, through some of the strategies that they're using. So my questions to sort of consider as part of the panel, is really taking it back a step. And before we even ask what strategies people use, we should ask if they are willing to engage others in this subject area. And if they are, who are they willing to talk to? If not, why don't they want to talk to people about these issues? So then we might be able to think about different approaches in terms of those that invoke not only a speaker's ethos, but also the ethos of scientists in terms of the case of appealing to the science religious or community leaders in terms of appealing to values or even shared social values such as justice or even economists and business analysts, and analysts when appealing to economic feasibility. So really what are some of the different kinds of credibility or ethos do we look at in terms of expert or expertise? And what does that mean in terms of the particular audience that we wish to address? And that's all I had. Thank you, Carolyn. So next we have Isaac Thornley from the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change at York University with a presentation called There is No Apocalypse, Psychoanalytic and Indigenous Climate Justice Critiques of Climate Change Discourse. Hey, Isaac. Hello, thank you very much. Can everyone hear me and see the screen? Yes. Great, thank you. So uh, hello, my name is Isaac Thornley and I'm a PhD student in environmental studies at York University in the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change. Uh, my main research area is about applying um, <clears throat> a psychoanalytic Marxist framework to the history <clears throat> and ongoing struggles related to the Trans Mountain Expansion Project. Um, but I also work as a communications professional and do quite a bit of like web development and writing for organizations interested in social and environmental justice. Um, but today my focus is a bit broader. Uh, the title of my presentation is There Is No Apocalypse, uh, Psychoanalytic and Indigenous Climate Justice Critiques of Climate Change Discourse. Um, I'm going to discuss how both strands of literature contribute in some similar ways to a critique of mainstream climate change discourse um, but overall, I'm interested in the following question. Uh, how might constructing climate change as a matter of immediate, irreparable, universal urgency obscure the political economic causes of the ecological crisis and desensitize us to its effects? Um, and even a more broad question that I could pose for everyone maybe is, 
uh, <clears throat> what is the relationship between urgency, crisis, communication, and our shared capacity for social change? Uh, and my basic claim is that despite the predominant tone of urgency and apocalyptic imagery expressed in much of the climate change discourse, uh, it is by no means clear that such an approach effectively drives systemic change or mobilizes popular support for such change. And I believe this is echoed in critiques by both the psychoanalytic and indigenous climate justice literatures. Um, but I should say something I'm very interested in is for those of you doing more empirical work, um, do you agree with that? Do you think that that claim I've made sort of holds up? Uh, do you, would you support it or would you complicate it in some way? I'm sort of uh, at the early stages of building a paper, and this is somewhat adjacent to my main research project. So forgive me for being a bit speculative at this point. Uh, so I'll start with the psychoanalytic critiques, and I'm largely drawing on the work of Slavoj Žižek, who sort of draws from a Lacanian psychoanalytic uh, perspective and pairs it with sort of a Marxist ideology critique. Uh, one of the sort of classic concepts he works with is called disavowal, which is basically a simultaneous knowing and not knowing. So it's distinct from denial in that it's not about outright negation, but it's more of a kind of ambivalent uh, way that people get stuck or that whole social formations get stuck in relation to something they know to be true, but are unable to uh, put that knowledge into action. And so a lot of the psychoanalytic concepts deal with a similar way of thinking about things in a kind of ambivalent way, whether it's disavowal, melancholia, keep blue focus more on uh, fossil fuel systems, talk about oil addiction, and so on. Um, so the basic claim that the psychoanalytic literature makes is that knowledge and more information is not enough because people are not exclusively rational decision makers. So instead of just focusing on more information, uh, more knowledge, getting the word out there, we need to care about, I guess, the more emotional side, the level of affect, and the unconscious uh, ambivalences that inform our relation to climate change. Um, the indigenous climate justice critiques that I'm drawing from are uh, people like Kyle White. Um, and he's, you know, done a lot of critiques on the sort of false universalism of climate change discourse, the idea that we are all in this together, the idea that climate change represents a kind of fundamentally novel problem for humans in the world, sort of obscures the history of colonialism and the persistence of colonialism and the way that the experiences of indigenous people uh, of colonialism has very much entailed a climate change and various forms of environmental injustice. Uh, so he has work critiquing the idea of climate tipping points, and he offers uh, as a sort of response this, this idea of relational tipping points, which is basically getting at um, this trade-off between the large-scale urgency and immediacy of the action required to address the crisis. Uh, on the other hand, there is a need to develop slow, patient relations of care and consent, which cannot happen overnight. So there's a bit of a trade-off between the relationships required to address the crisis and the urgency required to address the crisis. So that conflict or ambivalence is something I'm interested in as well. Um, I will leave it there and I'll just say, um, yeah, very interested if anyone has any thoughts about the potential application of psychoanalytic categories to anything that you've come up uh, against in your research. So thank you very much. Thanks, Isaac. So next we have uh, Yisheng Li, who is here in person with us. Uh, he is studying at Ted Rogers School of Management at Toronto Metropolitan University. And the title of his presentation is Homophily and Climate Change Denial. Just give me a second to bring it up. All right, can everybody hear me? So, okay, now I'm on mute. Hey, you're on. Okay, cool. Can everybody hear him? Yeah. Online? Yeah. Okay. okay. Just give me a sec uh, yeah, sure. to um, share.
All right, thank you everyone. I'm so delighted to be here. My name is Yishun Li. I'm a PhD student at uh, Toronto Metropolitan University. So my presentation title today is Homophily and Climate Change Denial. So next slide, please. So I have a quiz for all of you. So the consensus that humans are causing risk of glo uh, global warming is shared by what percentage of publishing climate scientists? Uh, of course, the exact number may vary, you know, depending on what survey I, I refer to. Just, just follow your hunch. Maybe I, I will give you 10 seconds. 50, okay. 80. 99. So maybe we can go to the next slide. <laughs> yeah, just. All right, so according to your survey conducted in uh, 2016, so over 90% of climate scientists uh, have that consensus. Uh, just, just on a side note, only 12% of the US public uh, got this range right. So surprise, surprise. It doesn't matter if the consensus number is 90% or even 100%. What strikes me most is the degree to which the overwhelming scientific consensus on climate change has been severely underestimated by the general public, at least in the United States. So my question is the following. Why are we and our public discourse so polarized when it comes to uh, climate change? You know, some people view it as an existential threat to human civilization, while others dismiss it as a, as a hoax. So, next slide. So I'm a computational social science researcher who stumbled upon uh, climate change debates. I believe homophily is at least one very plausible explanation. You may hear of that famous adage, birds of a further flock together. So homophily is essentially a mechanism of building social ties with like-minded folks. You can think of it as a, as a social tribe of people who share same values, beliefs, or worldviews, let's say people who agree or disagree climate change. So why is homophily such a powerful force shaping our opinions on Sorry, uh, shaping our opinions on climate change. Well, we humans tend to um, distinguish us from them, which not only helps uh, build trust with uh, in-group members, but also drives divisions between out-group members. Uh, this sort of dichotomous membership, I mean, climate change activists versus climate change uh, deniers, breeds in-group favoritism. Uh, and strengthens your appeal within your own tribe by provoking hostility against enemy tribes. For example, uh, climate change deniers call climate change activists uh, radical socialists who want to destroy our country. So, next slide. Maybe to add a little bit of context, we're living in a post-truth society, so, uh, which makes it a, a little bit difficult for, for everyday people to distinguish uh, nonsense or pseudoscience from, from legitimate scientific argumentation. The climate change, uh, understanding the impact of climate change is not that hard, but nevertheless, some uh, education and knowledge is important to our understanding of this very complex issue. Uh, big, corpora uh, big corporations like oil companies fund uh, quote unquote contrarian research so they can claim oh this is a very uh, controversial issue we don't have definitive answers so on and so forth this is a tactic uh, called the manufacture of doubt uh, often often by you know political or vested interests so uh, um, lastly millions of online uh, fake online personas you know bots and trolls uh, swiftly spread the sheer volume of uh, climate change misinformation and disinformation so when such alternative facts, if you will, are framed as conspiracy theories, the, the fallouts are especially corrosive. You know, the, the decline of tr trust in science. Scientists are often derided as untrustworthy whenever they find you know, some uh, inconvenient truth. And the erosion of, uh, of democratic institutions we see some um, environmental deregulations and uh, pro-fossil fuels uh, fuels uh, legislation being rolled out in some in some countries. Uh, yeah, so uh, 
Uh, recently, uh, NYU social psychologist Jonathan Haidt uh, wrote an essay on, uh, in the, uh, the Atlantic. I recommend everyone to, to read this essay. What, uh, why the past 10 years of American life has been uniquely stupid? Uh, you better answer social media. So social media is a technology that is as empowering as it is disruptive. So what fascinates me is uh, the manifestations of climate change denial on social media, namely echo chambers and, uh, and filter bubbles, uh, in which you know, perspectives, uh, interpretations, or narratives uh, are reinforced or, or amplified by repeatedly interacting with uh, somewhat homogenous users or, or content. Uh, for instance, the right figure we see uh, shows a climate change activist rose uh, green dots prefer to interact with other climate change activists uh, the same dynamics hold true for climate change skeptics, were, you know, rose red dots. So uh, they, uh, as a result, they form their own echo chamber, i.e. highly clustered uh, online communities. Um, uh, having said that, a uh, growing body of uh, evidence suggests that echo, uh, this metaphor of echo chamber and field bubbles might be a little bit overblown. You know, people are unlikely to turn into climate change uh, deniers simply by watching a whole bunch of video clips you, uh, recommended by YouTube, they are more likely to already have their own views and just seek uh, confirmation uh, online. Uh, so I guess I will stop uh, here, but maybe you can go to uh, quickly go to the, my re reference slides. So because uh, for those of you who are interested in climate change related misinformation or disinformation, do check the, I think the third reference uh, Professor Stefan Lewandowski, who is uh, perhaps the best uh, expert in, in, in this field, and he's one of my intellectual heroes who in inspires my research. Yeah. Thank you, Yisheng. And finally, we have Charlotte Potter. Um, Charlotte, are you there? Yeah, there's Charlotte, so you can share your screen. Charlotte is studying in the School of Environmental Design and Rural Planning at University of Guelph. And the title of her presentation is Instrumental or Intrinsic Sustainable Transition Pathways and the Construction of Knowledge. Take it away. Uh, great. OK, so hi, everyone. And thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Charlotte Potter, obviously. Uh, I'm a first year PhD student in rural studies at the University of Guelph. Um, I have a BA and an MSc in anthropology. And today I'll be talking to you about my PhD research, which is focused on sustainable transition pathways in agriculture. So my study will examine sustainable agriculture, exploring how conventional agricultural systems, which contribute to environmental and social degradation, um, may be transformed to ensure the continued food and nutrition needs for a growing population while staying within the Earth's carrying capacity and mitigating climate change. So in other words, what does a transition pathway from a conventional to a sustainable agricultural system look like? And to understand this transition process, I'll employ a systems thinking approach, which aims to understand phenomena by identifying how elements interact and relate to each other within systems and what relationships, elements, or leverage points are most critical um, to the system's function or output. So systems thinking argues that the most influential leverage points affecting the deepest and most long lasting change are not physical symptoms or events, but their mental models. So the ideology, values, and beliefs that motivate and shape how systems are designed. And these represent the underlying reasoning that guide actions and underpin systems outcomes. So they're deeply ingrained assumptions, generalizations, and representations that become formalized, uh, formalized in systems and infrastructure, which shape how we observe, understand, and learn. So mental models are representations of paradigms and paradigms are the interpretive framework which guide the organization of scientific ideas and the production of knowledge. Um, and these paradigms are based on shared beliefs, values and assumptions and are therefore culturally, socially and historically mediated. But diverse experiences of the world will lead to context specific paradigms. So this helps to illustrate the impact of history and social ideologies, um, as well as values on the production of science and the production of knowledge. So 
Given this, we can kind of see how agricultural systems reflect context-specific approaches to the construction of knowledge, and that different paradigms will lead to different innovative approaches to tackling sustainability issues. Um, but we do see that dominant agriculture and sustainability science are largely and overwhelmingly rooted in a Western scientific tradition, um, but also that alternative sustainable systems already exist as evidenced by indigenous, traditional, small scale and family farmers globally. Um, and these diverse systems are informed by diverse knowledge bases um, in, that are based in place-based experiences of the world. Uh, but by assuming this universal objective scientific truth, Western science has historically undervalued and replaced alternative systems, which effectively ignores potential sustainable innovative solutions. Um, so in my work, uh, I'm kind of turning to, to the use of two analytical categories, which represent different knowledge paradigms, um, which on one side is intrinsic and the other is instrumental. So I kind of, I hope to understand the ideologies and beliefs that underpin agri-food systems to understand how mental models can either support or hinder sustainability um, and characterized by an instrumental knowledge paradigm. Dominant agri-food systems tend to be informed by Western science situated in a Eurocentric school of thought and based in a separation of humans from nature, as well as the universality um, and objectivity of knowledge. But then conversely, um, the intrinsic knowledge uh, is more context specific um, and it remains inextricable from the people and the places that it's based in. Um, so it has to be under, understood holistically in terms of its cultural framework, as well as its basis and fundamental connection between people and the natural world. So through these categories, I hope to understand how people, places, and nature interact in different contexts, and how these experiences inform different knowledge paradigms, ultimately shaping agricultural systems, and underpinning sustainable uh, systems outcomes. So, Basically, in conclusion, through my research, I hope to illustrate the importance and value of localized forms of knowledge, understanding how mental models, values, and beliefs shape sustainability outcomes, while also recognizing that effective climate change adaptation will require power imbalances to be reconfigured um, in order to make space for these non-Western perspectives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlotte. All right, so let's move on to the Q&A discussion. Um, it seemed like some of the presenters had questions for each other ready to go. Um, so maybe we could start with that if any of you wanna jump in with your questions. Like for example, I, Isaac, you had, how, how could the psychoanalytic theory apply? Yeah, should I just say it out loud or should I yeah, paste ahead. them in the chat? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll put, I had some just in my slides that I'll paste into the chat. Um, but yeah, a, a more sort of a selfish question for me since I do do research on psychoanalysis in relation to climate change and environmental politics is just what sort of use or utility do you see uh, in applying psychoanalysis to these things? Um, or, you know, if you want to take a more critical uh, lens, like what are some of the limits of applying uh, psychoanalytic or psychological categories um, to understanding climate change? Anybody want to jump in on that? Maybe we could make it more broad and just there's a lot of psychology involved in communicating climate change and um our sorry daniel you have a, a um, i mean question. i i could uh i could jump in uh, about the psychoanalytic approach yeah, yeah go um, ahead so yeah thank you uh thank you isaac should i stand in front of the camera or? yeah sure um yeah i uh have you i actually have a, okay I'll, re I'll reply to your question with another question have you seen uh have you seen Adam Curtis's latest documentary, some of the stuff on climate change and how he's kind of making the same point? It's, it's interesting 
to try to understand how emotionality, how affect actually gets motivates people. One of the clips that he had at one of the beginnings of the episodes was the famous clip of the woman escaping wildfires, I think near Malibu, uh, screaming, oh my God, oh my God, I have to get out of here, the horses, the horses, stuff like that. Very, very jarring. Um, but, uh, and that kind of thing, and that for me, is a really good portrayal. I don't see. I don't know if this really works large large scale, but for people actually experiencing the crisis to that kind of that, with that kind of uh, immediacy and power, it definitely will <clears throat> leave an in, an indelible mark, regardless of probably regardless of what their political ideology was beforehand. And but uh, but yeah. So and and I think uh, like Mark Fisher also uses um, same as uh, Slavoj Žižek, the Lacanian. Uh, approach of breaking down the, um, I forget which one's which, the real versus the reality. So I'm sure you already know about this stuff, but that I think that is a fruitful area to explore. And uh, though though I still have my own concerns about it being a scalable thing, because um, the one limit of of psychoanalysis is that it doesn't really it doesn't really ask broadly, does this will this work for I don't know. It's something that I haven't given enough thought to. Maybe I don't want to take up everyone's time with this, but but we have to think about the general interests of different actors, and this might not work for everyone, and uh, and maybe aligning people's or helping to see people, uh, helping for people to align their own interests with the interests of uh, a just transition, for example, is is something that we should be exploring. And maybe I don't know. Maybe you could riff on that, or someone else has something to add. Thanks. Can I respond to that? Sure. Thank you. That was really great. I need to check out uh, the most recent Adam Curtis uh, work. I haven't seen it yet. Uh, so thank you for the recommendation. And um, yeah, I, I could say so much, but I'll keep it short and just say, yes, um, psychoanalysis can be useful, but in order for it to be scalable and to have a kind of uh, utility for social analysis, um, it needs to be sort of de-individualized. And I think Lacanian theory offer some opportunities for that and the, the sort of symbolic imaginary real um, framework that you touched on is definitely one way of um, having a sort of social concept of the unconscious or having a concept of the unconscious that is not about a sort of individual internal um, sort of hidden area. Um, so and, the, and I totally agree with what you said, like if we sort of commit ourselves to a kind of psychologism that doesn't pay attention to things like what are the material interests of different actors and the context of different uh, environmental conflicts, and we reduce everything to a level of kind of what's my emotional experience of the situation, we lose a lot. So, and I think this is um, sort of one connection I see to the, the, the fourth presenter, um, uh, is sort of how do we think about the relationship between uh, subjectivity, ideology, in relation to some of these broader material conditions. And so I, I, I didn't talk about it much today, but I'm basically interested in psychoanalysis insofar as it is, you know, used alongside a kind of like historical materialist or Marxist or some sort of structural framework. But thank you very much for the question and comments. Here in person, we have a question here in person. Go ahead. Thank you. I have a question for Caroline. Um, you were talking about the different generations and how they. I, I would like to know if if you have some done any research about how the different generations that you mentioned um, access uh, information about climate change. Like, where are these? Um, sources, like how are they differentiated within generations and what can we do as researchers to more effectively reach those um, spaces to share our research with the different generations? Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, good question. Um, we're still coding some of that information that we've gathered. So we, we specifically asked our different audiences and, and now we're trying to group them according to the different generational cohorts. Um, but recognizing kind of first off, you know, do you believe that climate change is, you know, the result of human, human centered um, and, and by and large, we're seeing, you know, some early trends indicating that that is fairly consistent, especially in those younger generations, where we're seeing some interesting um, 
not necessarily conflicts, but when I talked about strategies is in, you know, where, where some of these younger generations are actually getting information and where they're being influenced. And so, you know, in thinking about, you know, justice and morality and, you know, looking for connections on that front, and then how, you know, it appears that a significant number of those younger generations are influenced predominantly through parents, through adults. And, you know, if you twin that with what we saw in the most recent um, Ontario elections, you know, we saw, you know, across the board, all generations really low turnout, but more specifically in those younger generations. And not only that, but here locally, they were commenting that so few, unless they were Green Party representatives, you know, was was sustainability or climate change even part of the agenda or part of the conversation. So the concern is obviously we're seeing those younger generations. They're definitely, you know, using those digital tools. And you asked about, you know, where they are, where they're talking about it. They're definitely connecting through social media and what we would anticipate on those digital online um, connections. But what we're seeing is sort of a disconnect in terms of, you know, how they are, are they talking about it or are they trying to encourage people to take action? So it's trying to figure out, you know, where they sit and how they're engaging people, what strategies they're using, but are they even thinking about it as a strategy? I, I hope that answers your question. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing more about what those, what the trends that we're going to see coming out of it, but it, it's not quite ready yet. We have another in-person question over here, Ola, if you could get to them. Yeah, my question was for Yishank. So I, I was very fascinated with that, like social network of social networks that you showed us. And I was wondering if, if you knew, like we, like I saw those two clusters of like activists and skepticals. And I was wondering if, if you could tell us, or if you knew like who, who, what kind of person could be like that intermediate node between these skepticals and these activists, and maybe if they could give us some hope on how to reach these skepticals. Yeah, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you. That's a, such a great question. I guess because uh, maybe to to draw on a, a similar paper in sociology, the strengths of weak ties. I guess so. To answer your question, we need to find some, shall we say, bridge nodes who share lots of weak ties with you know different uh, different groups of people you know uh, both both friends or or even acquaintances on the you know on the side of uh, climate change activism uh, and on the side of uh, uh, climate change denial or, or, or skepticals and that uh, I think may, we, we should also maybe to just add a little bit more to introduce some um, psychologists our pre panelists to talk a lot about psychology to uh, to introduce some uh, psychology principles uh, on, on social media to, to maybe help us better pre debunk and sometimes even pre-bunk uh, climate change uh, misinformation and disinformation and and I think you know I remember some some empirical research suggests if you remove you know some highly influential nodes in your social network you can sort of cut off that uh, that spread of, of uh, climate change misinformation, disinformation, or, or conspiracy theories. So I hope this maybe sort of uh, answer your question. Thank you. Thanks. We have a question online from Hugo. Yeah, thank you. So I think my question will be for interest for like everyone that kind of want to react. Um, I kind of see the OK Doomer has the new climate denial. And there's like a survey lately that got out in Quebec on the firm, firm Leger, which stated that 50% of the Quebecer has eco anxiety and that 20% of the youth Quebecers actually thought we were fucked no matter what. So I think the approach we took on being extremely catastrophic was probably not that efficient, but at the same time, you know, it brought, I am, the people that reacted because of the catastrophe. And I imagine there's a lot of people are a bit more sensitive that do that. And you also look at like in Ontario, 57 people didn't vote. And like among these people, for sure, some really think climate action is a required thing. So how should we tailor communication 
to ensure that people actually want to act. Um, because I, I'm, I don't think climate denier is, I can't think people that climate denier will probably stay like that for a long time until they see benefit, economic benefit of it. Um, so I really worry more about the people that know climate change happened and don't want to act. So how can we tailor the messages to ensure that? And I'm really interested to see what's your input on that. Carolyn has her hand up if, if you want to, if that's in response. Uh, it actually wasn't. I was hoping that is it Yusheng would uh, respond to it. And then I wanted to suggest something to him as well. OK, so let's get Yusheng. Well, we haven't heard from from Charlotte yet. So maybe, Charlotte, if you could answer first, and then we'll pass it over to Yusheng. Yeah, um, so I don't think I necessarily have a direct answer to your question, more just um, you got me thinking about like kind of the concept of sustainability in general, kind of as like a, a syllogism and how it's defined accordingly to the people who are doing the talking. So I'm wondering if maybe part of the problem is that um, the, the communication around sustainability and environmentalism in general is kind of, it's coming from, um, from over here so there's just like no connection between the like the real life experiences of people and the people who are doing the like communicating and, and defining of what's important um because i think yeah like sustainability doesn't really mean anything and it's kind of like this very broad concept that can kind of lose its impact and its power um and people like lose interest in in sustainability as like a cause when there's really no um no connection being made to their life experiences so i don't know yeah you just got me thinking about that as maybe a, an idea uh you saying if you want to pitch in Oh yeah, just to quick add something. So actually this is one of my future research uh, directions down the road maybe too. I'm considering uh, using some, you know, uh, text analytics approach to extract a linguistic and rhetoric feature of, you know, uh, climate change, both climate change activism messaging and climate change denial uh, messaging to, to find out some, you know, what are the uh, most appealing uh, elements of those languages so we can, you know, better design mitigation strategies. What, what makes uh, a climate change uh, activism message so uh, so persuasive or, or on the other hand, what makes a climate change denial message so, so toxic, you know, things like that. If you wanted to uh, complement that. Me? Okay. Um, uh, when you were talking about conspiracy and then Hugo, you were talking about some recent statistics. There was a study just recently out of Sherbrooke uh, where they looked at conspiracy and what percentage of Canadians believe in conspiracy because they're concerned about uh, the tendency towards uh, violence. Anyways, they found that 10% strongly believe in conspiracy and another 15% mostly believe in conspiracy theories. So one of my side projects is conspiracy theories in and around vaccine and vaccine hesitancy. Um, and all of that can sort of be overlaid in terms of kind of the climate denier, climate mis disinformation. So I just, I wondered, Yusheng, if you've read anything by Jenny Rice, her book, Awful Archives. She writes about conspiracy theory and you know what, what connotes as evidence. It's pretty interesting. Interesting reading. Well, first, uh, thanks for suggesting that book. I, I haven't heard of it before, but uh, maybe I can quickly mention uh, one of my takeaways from from literature review. So, uh, as climate change uh, de deniers have a sort of different uh, group dynamics uh, on social media because you know, uh, climate uh, for climate change deniers, climate change is not their priority. So they are more likely, you know, to get get to know each other on social media 
due to their other common interest in other uh, conspiracy theories, for example, some you know political related conspiracy theories or or even anti-vaccine conspiracy theories, which is another my potential direction to look into the intersection between different conspiracy theories on social media. Uh, can we find you know some um, commonalities, let's say, between uh, between anti-vaccine conspiracy theory and climate change related conspiracy theories? Interesting. And Isaac, uh, did you have something to say? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting uh, question and, and a very interesting responses. Um, I guess I would just say that I think one thing that Hugo brought up was this uh, sort of relationship between uh, action and knowledge and uh, the idea that I'm not sure what the current stats are in Canada, but the last time I checked, most people do believe in anthropogenic climate change. And so then the question becomes, um, people generally seem to know and agree and believe, and yet still, nonetheless, there are some barriers and difficulties. And I think we can come up with any number of different explanations, psychological, economic, uh, political, et cetera. Um, and I see psychoanalysis as playing a small role in that larger puzzle. Another thing I would say is like in my research on uh, sort of pipeline politics in Canada. Um, on the one hand, you can say, oh, there's a bunch of conspiracy theorists who don't believe in um, climate change, who want to sort of build pipelines and continue fossil fuel uh, extraction and tar sands expansion at all costs. Is that a conspiracy theory? On the other hand, we can look at it as um, people have certain interests at stake and have their livelihoods at stake in terms of different uh, as certain kinds of practices and industries being the sources of their livelihoods, which are going to make them have certain priorities and make them more likely to commit themselves to certain beliefs. So I think on the one hand, we can look at it as a kind of uh, purely abstract epistemological problem of information and misinformation. But I think we also need to look at the relationship between sort of um, the, the, the texture of people's livelihoods and lived experience, how that relates to broader political economic structures and how within that we see certain tendencies uh, towards different kinds of beliefs or ideologies, or maybe we could call them conspiracy theories. So we have a, a question in the chat from Yanis. Is, is it conspiracy if the system is built for slash with extraction? Does anybody want to comment on that? I could say something briefly to that. If I understand, I mean, it's just, on the one hand, I think when I see, when I see a lot of talk of conspiracy theory, and I think what this question sort of raises is like, is the system working the way it's supposed to, or are we seeing a sort of crisis in the system? Um, and so I, the, the basic way that I look at say ideology fantasy conspiracy theory is that you know capitalism contains certain contradictions that are built into it and different kinds of justificatory fantasies are used to sort of conceal those antagonisms that's like the basic model of like ideology that i'm working with so i don't know if i have a simple yes no to that question but i definitely see ideology and conspiracy theory as working part and parcel with some of the crises and contradictions that are intrinsic to capitalism and extraction. So Carolyn Siegel in the chat room said, there are several extant mining conservation partnerships and a huge private sector presence within climate policy. Interesting comment. Um, so we're, we're gonna have to wrap up this discussion, unfortunately, um, to make room for the break right before the next um, session. So thank you so much, everybody. That was a lively discussion, very interesting, and a good compliment to the panel discussion we had this morning. And so we'll, we'll see you again in 10 minutes. Thanks, everybody. All right. Welcome to our session, Rights and Wrongs. Today, I have a pleasure to moderate the session and I have a pleasure to uh, introduce our four presenters. 
Two of them will join us online and two of them are with me here in person. So we will start with Corina uh, Deli Starna and her present from the School of Environmental Studies, Queen's University, on her presentation on climate change and water security, exploring the potential risk of NATAC events on drinking water safety in Canada's rural and remote communities. Karina, uh, please uh, share your screen. Thank you. Right. Can you hear me okay? Uh, we can, but we see a screen right uh, in front that covers your... Okay, now it's better. Okay, now we see you. Thank you. All right. Well, good afternoon. And first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very pleased to be here. So if I were in the same room with you today, I would start by asking you, give me a show of hands of how many of you think about the potential threats to your drinking water when you pour your first cup of coffee in the morning? If your answer is never, then I'm guessing that you live in a larger community that has never experienced a drinking water advisory or emergency. In Canada, water insecurity is a small community problem that mostly affects rural, remote and indigenous communities. In 2019, 87% of all drinking water advisories were issued due to process and equipment related issues. That these systems don't, re don't deliver reliably services is a serious problem. Water insecurity affects people's mental and physical health, educational success, food security, and much, much more. It also jeopardizes the nation's commitment to equity, sustainability, and indigeneity. I am fascinated by systems thinking and I'm applying it to untangle the many socioeconomic, technical, environmental factors that have an impact on the reliability of small drinking water systems. Everything from how decisions are made about workforce training to how infrastructure projects are conceptualized, designed, and managed. There's still a great deal of uncertainty associated with climate change hazards. However, we know that slow onset as well as extreme events such as temperature and rainfall affect source water, the structural integrity of the infrastructure, as well as physical, chemical, and microbiological processes that can impact drinking water and public health. This figure here is just an example, and it shows the impacts of increases in temperature and natural organic matter on the water supply system. We can talk about it later if you want to ask me. Well, we understand less on NATAC events. This is still a relatively understudied area. NATACs connote multi-hazard risk scenarios that involve at least one natural hazard and one technological hazard. The details of the events on the slides don't really matter that much. What matters is what they have in common. These events happen not just because of design deficiencies or because of climatic conditions. They happen conjointly. The latest example in the upper left-hand corner on the slide, where an oil tank collapsed and polluted nearby rivers, is attributed to thawing permafrost. What makes NATEC so special from my standpoint is that based on research, they mostly involve facilities storing diesel, crude oil, and gasoline. They primarily involve vertical storage tanks and pipelines, which can lead to explosions, fires, and toxic dispersion, and which are often located in rural and remote areas. They're mostly caused by hazards we associate with climate change, flood and extreme temperature. And they frequently start a domino effect by causing cascading events on lifeline infrastructure, such as water, electricity, and gas. Also, they're often not recognized as NATACs, which makes learning about them difficult. Understanding threats to the functionality of water supply systems and managing them is the bread and butter of water sector professionals. 
Critical steps in that process are hazard recognition, risk assessment, and management. What makes Natex so special is that it represents multiple hazard categories and multiple vulnerabilities all wrapped into one. This makes it difficult to develop methodologies and tools, although researchers are engaged in our process. Hurdles to overcome, awareness. Natex are getting a lot more attention in Europe than in North America. A recent review of the literature showed that 80% of the articles originated in Europe. Researchers find that there's still little risk awareness among local stakeholders and land use planners. As far as implementation or best practices, a recent survey indicated that even in Europe, best practices around a number of criteria are not well developed, including multi-hazard mapping and maintenance of databases. In some then, NATAC events are expected to increase in frequency and severity and could exacerbate water security concerns for rural and remote communities. Hazard recognition, risk assessment, and management considerations are critical for water infrastructure planning and design, as well as drinking water emergency and safety planning. There is much that needs to be done to create awareness and engage with these events that result from a combination of climate hazards and technical incidents. Thank you. And as far as uh, opportunities for collaboration, I'm currently walk, working on a number of different things, including um, complexity, aspects of complexity. I know there is a presenter here, I think, for tomorrow who, uh, who works on that as well. So I'm going to stop sharing right now. Thank you very much, Karina, for such an exciting presentation. Your research is really interesting. Uh, we are moving on to Camille Anderson, who is here with us, and he's uh, from Polytechnique Montreal. I'm going to share the screen right now with his presentation. All right. Go ahead, Camille. My presentation will be in French because about uh, this slide uh, in English uh, you can read. Bon, uh, je travaille dans le domaine de l'économie de l'environnement, mais avec la bioéconomie et, la, et le développement durable. Et je fais ma thèse à l'université de Lille sous la direction de Étienne et Claire. Donc, ça me fait plaisir de participer avec vous. Donc, nous travaillons sur un modèle économique et pour, nous nous posons principalement la question de savoir comment et les politiques d'atténuation du changement climatique et influence le bien-être des individus compte tenu de, des inégalités qu'il peut y avoir entre de, entre des différentes catégories de population. Alors, cette question, il est, elle est importante dans le sens que on voit que les inégalités entre les gens, ça peut avoir des impacts sur l'environnement, mais ça peut également avoir, et les politiques de mitigation peuvent également avoir des impacts sur les inégalités. Et on constate également que malgré tout le débat qu'il y a eu, il y a vraiment très peu d'actions qui sont entreprises et des coordinations au niveau international, malgré l'accord de Paris. Et les, les inactions, ça dépend de différents types de facteurs et qui peuvent dépendre du, des ressources des pays. Donc, un pays qui a des ressources et qui peut produire et des énergies fossiles, ça va être difficile de lui convaincre de faire autrement. Également, ça dépend des, des inégalités entre les, pays, entre les pays, mais également des inégalités à l'intérieur des pays. Et ça dépend également du niveau de développement et du différence des niveaux de développement qu'il y a entre les pays. Donc, et dans, pour répondre à notre question, nous avons développé un modèle et théorique qui est basé sur un modèle de Zilberman, David Zilberman 2010 sur et la, la, la production de bioénergie. Alors, nous avons introduit les inégalités et par les préférences dans, le, dans ce modèle pour voir comment les, les, les faits qu'il y a des inégalités vont et 
à favoriser ou, ou non le, la mise en place de la transition énergétique. Et, et nous mettons également des émissions qui viennent à partir de la production et quand on, on utilise la terre. Et comme on est en économie, on utilise des, des comparaisons statiques et des simulations dans le cadre des modèles et d'équilibre général pour essayer de voir comment ça se passe et également comment ça devrait se passer et qui serait le mieux pour tout le monde. Donc, un autre modèle, je le présente ainsi rapidement ici, où on produit deux types de biens, et les, la nourriture ou les aliments, et puis tout, et y, tout autre type de biens qui peut être bien manufacturé ou service. Également, on utilise des sources d'énergie qui sont des parfaits substituts, mais qui sont des sources différentes. Il y a d'une part les énergies fossiles, et d'autre part, on a les bioénergies, mais qui est spécialement les biofoules dans notre cas. Et puis, pour produire les biens, c'est-à-dire la nourriture, les biens manufacturés et l'énergie, on utilise trois facteurs de production qui, peuvent, qui sont la terre, le capital et le travail. Donc, dans le cadre de ces modèles, il n'y a pas d'économie d'échelle et seulement les ressources en par habitant et compte. Donc, et bon, là, on définit une, une fonction d'utilité, donc c'est des trucs économiques, pour voir comment et pour mesurer et la, satisfa la satisfaction individuelle des gens. Et on définit également euh, euh, une fonction de bien-être pour voir quel est, quel est l'effet des choix des individus sur le bien-être de chacun et dans, dans une deuxième partie. Je vais avancer. Et donc, et en termes de résultats, on constate que les inégalités et peuvent et faire en sorte que, puisqu'il y a des inégalités, il y a une différence et dans la part de budget des gens selon leur niveau de revenu et qu'ils qu consacrent à la, à la consommation de, de chaque type de bien. Et quand et les gens ils sont moins riches, c'est-à-dire plus pauvres, ils consomment un peu plus, ils consacrent une plus grande part de leur budget à la consommation de la nourriture, alors que tant que vous avez beaucoup plus d'argent, eh bien, vous allez consommer d'autres types de biens et qui sont et des biens de luxe ou des biens plus élevés. Et donc, on, on constate que et pour, dans le cadre de la transition énergétique, le fait d'être moins riche et, et s'il y a transition énergétique, ça, cause, ça donne un double avantage aux riches, dans le sens que les prix des biens et, et manufacturés ils vont baisser, alors qu'ils ils, ils préféraient déjà ce type de biens. Alors que ça, ça donne exa exactement une double pénalité pour les pauvres, dans le sens que les biens qui les, les biens qui préfèrent vont, leur prix va augmenter et tandis que et la quantité qui va être produite va diminuer par le fait qu'on commence à produire de bioénergie. Et également pour les inégalités, on voit que l'introduction des biofoules et quand on produit des bioénergies, et eh bien ça fait une pression sur le prix des biens et agricoles puisque dans la première génération des biofoules, on utilise et il y a une concurrence en, pour l'utilisation de la terre. Et le fait qu'il y a une pression sur les prix des biens, ça va affecter directement le les budget des ménages les plus pauvres et ce qui va faire augmenter les inégalités. Donc, et oui, on, en conclusion, on voit que la transition énergétique est beaucoup plus difficile pour les gens les plus pauvres. Alors, comme possibilité de collaboration, on se pose la question, dans, actuellement, dans le cadre de ce modèle, on a considéré les premières, généra les premières générations de biofoules, alors que dans une seconde génération de, bio de biofoules, il est possible de produire à la fois les, biens, les aliments, et ou les biens agricoles avec et une part qui va être produite pour la consommation et une autre part qui va être utilisée pour la production de bioénergie. Donc, on, on se demande est-ce que ça ne va pas apaiser les, 
l'effet des prix qui avaient sur le, le, la production agricole. Et donc, pour finir, on se pose la question. Et aujourd'hui, il y a la majorité des, des habitants des pays les plus pauvres qui n'ont pas accès à une, à énergie, à une énergie propre pour, et pour, 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 la nourriture, pour faire la nourriture chez eux. Ainsi, et aujourd'hui, il y a plus de 3 millions de pauvres et 3 milliards de pauvres dans le monde. Et on se demande est-ce qu'il est vraiment possible de penser à la transition énergétique comme on le fait aujourd'hui sans penser au ACG. Merci. Thank you, Camille. It was a very exciting presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, so we are moving on to Yoyana Miaya Osko. I'm sorry if I misspelled your name. Uh, she's from political science at the University of Toronto, and she's going to present uh, her um, research on Andean indigenous resistance responding to resource extraction pressures. Yoyana. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, sorry. Yes, we do. Okay, can you see my presentation? Yes, we do. Okay, thank you. Um, Hello everyone, my name is Johanna Miraya Osco. I am from the indigenous community from the Andes of Peru. Uh, I am native speaker of Quechua language and activist of Quechua language and cultural revitalization. Um, today I would like to present um, my proposal and some projects that I am working on related to climate change. Um, this is the uh, this is a plan for my presentation. Um, this is a map of Peru. My research focuses on indigenous form of resistance against against mining industries. I will focus on three different regions: Arequipa, Cusco, and the region Apurima, where I am from. Um, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, no, yes. uh, could you please turn on your camera? Because we, yes. we just see oh, your okay. slides, okay, but sorry. we don't see you. We would love to see you. Thank you. Okay, okay. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is the map of Peru. And my research focuses on indigenous form of resistance against mining industry. I will focus on three different regions, Arequipa, Cusco, and the region of Apurima, where I am from. Uh, this is a picture of my community called Calcauso, where I am, where one mining project started recently. Uh, this is the mining operation located in my community. So the research focuses on two aspects. The first is looking at corporate strategies uh, of disruption, how mining companies are engaging with communities in order to achieve their private goals. Um, the second is looking community response of acquiescences, accumulations, alterations, and or resistance. How communities are engaging with mining companies to achieve collective and or individual goals. Um, particularly my research um, attempts to emphasize the latter because I would like to understand um, what processes factors lead to resistance how communities decide to resist, what kind of resistance these communities deploy, and how they, uh, their intrinsic cultural values shape the, the kind of political governance and land and water management that these Andean communities practice. Um, this, this research will investigate examples of indigenous communities based of um, basic resistance, specifically how indigenous form of governance shaped the degree of successful indigenous resistance to mining, how communities are organized politically, um, the degree of community disruption can determine their ability to reject or define the term of the mining companies' access to their lands. Uh, my research uh, questions um, are um, given similar pressure from mining companies. Why are some communities responding so differently? My secondary questions are why um, have some communities been more disrupted than others by the state support mining corporations? 
And my assumption uh, is the entrance of the resource extraction companies into Andean communities has uh, this is stabilizing effect on traditional land-based management and governance structure, which Lakta Kamachi, as well as community relation and practices. Uh, my methodology it will be uh, ethnographic research. Um, so I, I would like to explain more about Lakta Kamachi form of governance. Yachta Kamachi and Kunyonakwi are three words in Quechua that means the following in English. Yachta um, is community, Kamachi is governance and duties. Kunyonakwi is come together for a meeting. Um, community governance or Yachta Kamachi is a common form of governance in these indigenous communities that entails how the decision-making process is conducted, carried out and rewarded. Um, the Yachta Kamachi form of community governance allow us to gra grasp uh, how indigenous communities govern collective resource of the common distribu distribute labor and participate in other key aspects of the future community planning. Uh, finally, I would like to uh, share some of the projects that I am working on. And I would like to expand this kind of project to my own community. Uh, for now, I am working in the community of Surite in the region of Cusco on a water management project as a way to do research and support the community in the reconstruction of water channels. This community, like most agrarian communities in the Peruvian Andes, is depending on local water resources um, that are threatening the both climate change and whose contamination levels uh, are ex exacerbated by mining industry activity. Um, in the community of Surite, there are no mining industry, but there is water scarcity due to the climate change. So for my research, it is interesting to do comparative study, studies with different communities and try to understand how they respond to climate change and also extractive industries. I emphasize lo that local um, traditional governance is important for local autonomy over water resource and its capacity to plan for a sustainable and um, secure water future depends in part on integrated local environment indigenous knowledge. Um, the Andean mountains are extremely vulnerable to climate change, um, damage to the ecosystem, threatening the livelihood of the people living there. The majority of the Andean indigenous communities are extremely um, vulnerable to climate change because their traditional economies depend um, on the seasonal water. Uh, this vulnerability is exacerbated by mining operations as most are located below the water table and affects the ground, uh, ground water. And therefore my research focuses in the form of resistance and response to communities against mining corporation. I am interested in alternative projects um, that can support the community as well. I particularly like to work on projects that, um, and research that can help communities at the same time so with this research um, and this type of project, I am interested in exploring community land and water management and the connection of the traditional practices. For this, I argue included and the Andean cosmovision community values and mutual help and social network into the analysis of indigenous governance and resistance. Community with a strong cultural ties seems to have to put up more resistance against mining. Um, this may sometimes look like a uh, subtle, subtle form of resistance. Um, I suggest that indigenous governance concept of Yachta Kamachi can be useful framework uh, for understanding indigenous resistance through the analysis of community governance and how this form of governance allows community to address their own their concern internally in their own best interests and more successfully resist pressure of mining investment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johanna. It was a very exciting presentation. Thank you. All right, moving on, uh, I'd like to introduce Adako Chandu from School of Environmental Studies at Queen's University 
who is with us uh, in person, and she's going to present her research on flood risk in informal settlements of Nigeria. So let me share the screen. Just give me a moment, please. Yeah, so hello everyone. I'm happy to be here today to share my research with you. We know that climate impacts are worsening and will continue to get worse if the current trends are not reversed. We're experiencing rising temperatures, increased frequency and intensity of heavy rainfall and flooding. Simply put, climate change is real, rapidly advancing and threatening humanity. And amid all these um, vulnerable populations will be the most impacted and will be rendered even more vulnerable. And by vulnerability here, I mean the combination of factors that determine the degree to which someone's life, livelihood, property, and other assets are put at risk from climate events. The latest IPCC report also underscored these trends and sounded a code red for humanity. So my research studies flooding in Portacourt, Nigeria's fourth largest city, and a very economically important city as a result of oil and gas operations, which is the main driver of Nigeria's economy. I embed this research within an environmental justice framework. And environmental justice is simply the fair and meaningful involvement of people, regardless of race, color, status, or income, with respect to the development, impl implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Environmental justice seeks to address the unfair exposure of poor and marginalized communities to harms associated with land use issues. It is relevant in my work that seeks to include the voices of people who experience flooding annually in seeking control, mitigation, and adaptation strategies to a problem that is only set to rise in the coming years. Addressing climate threats like flooding through a meaningful degree of mitigation and adaptation and multiple levels of decision making and response must be informed by the precepts of environmental justice. And um, as inclusion is one goal of environmental justice, I looked at flooding in both the formal and informal settlements of Port Harcourt. So we see that so far, research on flooding has focused on the formal settlements of Port Harcourt, my research city. So, and uh, unfortunately, it's the wish of government that these settlements be erased, even though more than 500,000 people live there. So as a result, there has been no representation of these communities in flooding research, which my work strives to address. So my research affirmed how climate-related disasters like flooding hit the poor hardest, making them bear the most load in terms of overall global climate impacts. So I saw how residents in former settlements of the city who have access to or can afford basic services have a higher adaptive um, capacity in comparison to those residents of informal settlements. So residents of informal settlements are forced to remain in flooded homes as they have no alternative, exposing them to associated health impacts of flooding like cholera and infections. So another thing I found in the informal settlements was a mirroring of similar events seen on the international screen sorry, on the international scene among vulnerable populations. So like in um, April, just this April, there was a very serious flooding in South Africa. And during these flooding events, we saw that the most death tolls and damages were among the poorer residents of informal communities. So given the higher levels of exposure and impact, it's simply unconscionable that people are forced to experience such events yearly with every year's event being worse than the previous. So even though my work was um, in Nigeria, so these are trends that we we'll see if we look closely within our own communities, we would see that such uh, environmental climate related impacts uh, have differential impacts on communities. So this is a picture of um, uh, during the field work when we're doing this survey. So I did surveys and uh, interviews and uh, focus groups. So uh, in one of the informal settlements, I did my work. So um, going forward, we'll see that addressing climate-related threats like flooding through a meaningful mitigation of adaptation. Now, uh, when we talk of mitigation and adaptation, like we mustn't forget that these are, they are two sides of the same coin. So you can't talk of one without talking of the other. 
so um, addressing climate related trends um, on also response needs to be informed by the tenets of environmental justice. So our ability to reduce harm, especially to those most at risk, depends on ensuring that these challenges are brought to the fore. We must talk about it. We must involve um, marginalized communities and research. We must make sure their voices are brought to the fore. So in summary, response to issues of climate change must leave no one behind. So we've heard this also this morning uh, when um, uh, Kelly spoke. So it must leave no one behind, uh, including those who live in, I would say, purported illegal or informal settlements. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adako. It was an exciting presentation. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for your presentations today. It, it's I, I got I learned so much today. Thank you. Um, so, any questions from the audience in person and online? Okay, so I'll break the ice with a very simple question. I would like to know your opinion. Are we running out of the sources of fresh water and land use due to climate change? Who wants to start on that? Maybe Adako? Um, I, I would say, um, I, I'm gonna maybe put, um, uh, I, I wanna get um, her name on the spot. Um, she spoke about um, the issues in Peru and uh, she also mentioned water in her, access to water in her research. So maybe she'll be in the best position to uh, answer this question. Uh, Joanna? Joanna, yeah. And would you like to respond to this question, the break ice question? Excuse me, can you repeat that question because I couldn't hear. Uh, so this is a break ice question. Do you believe that we are running out of the sources of fresh water and land use due to climate change? Yeah, I will say based on the experiences that I am working in communities, um, especially in the community of uh, Cusco, um, I will say there is a conflict between communities because of water scarcity. Um, based on my interviews in these communities, um, the changes, I, I, I was able to hear different stories about what kind of um, a, what kind of changes happen just uh, in two decades in these communities. Um, in my own community where I am from, um, we are also facing water scarcity. Um, this is a community where I am from. And, and also we are uh, having a lot issue with mining corporation because most of the mining corporations are located in the, in the um, um, close to the river and where is the water which we call up Kialis. Um, so, so that's the main issue for us. Um, I would say, uh, yes, uh, there is some strong impact of climate change um, and also exacerbated by extractive industries. Thank you. Uh, does anyone want to add on, on that? Karina, Camille, would you like to add something? Okay, so in this case, I'd like to talk a little bit more about justice. So we heard from all, like across all the presentations, we heard that um, communities, uh, specifically uh, indigenous communities are on the front line of the climate change and they are affected the most. So what do you uh, suggest uh, to the government or us as a society should do in order to um, to make the to make this to make it more just to lease the burden of uh, of the impact. Uh, I can chime in with what um, we can do within our own capacity as uh, students, as researchers, and um, we see uh, in this climate discourse that there are two voices, and um, there is a voice that is the loudest. So, and there is also a voice people who cannot. Um, do not have the platform to advocate, um, to speak for themselves. So I would say we'll engage more in advocacy 
share stories. Storytelling is a storytelling is a very important part of um, aspect of research. It's very very relatable than speaking in abstract terms. So what we can do is those voices, those people maybe living in very remote areas. I would say people who are considered maybe subalterns, like who should go out there, engage with them, make sure their stories come to the limelight. So maybe if people listen to such very relatable stories, will change the way we think around these things. We see that, oh, there are humans who these things are impacting. So maybe the people on that other side will begin to maybe listen more. Thank you, Adako. Uh, anyone else? I mean, Oui, et je vais ajouter à, à ce propos, et comme moi, je suis dans les inégalités, et qu'il faut penser à mieux taxer les, les, les ressources, les ressources de la transition, et donc pour exercer les, les subventions et pour accompagner les, les gens les plus pauvres et pour et les faciliter et à travers la transition so maybe I can uh, translate for uh, people who do, do not speak, speak French. So my understanding of Camille's response is that uh, a solution would be to uh, tax fossil fuels and increase subsidies towards renewable energy and also increase uh, taxes on the people to basically redistrib redistribute the money towards uh, the transition. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Karina, would you like to add something to that? Uh, yes, <laughs> if I can. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm in, in, uh, obviously in agreement with um, incorporating um, as many voices uh, in the uh, discussion as possible. Um, but at the same time, I think um, a lot that we can learn from um, Indigenous communities in particular is a more holistic worldview, adopting a more holistic worldview, and um, and uh, considering uh, the um, the very many effects of our actions um, in a more um, comprehensive manner to inform policy decisions. And just to take one example, um, as we are trying to combat climate change with um, renewable energy projects and that sort of thing, um, we that also puts a huge burden on. Um, extracting more resources and uh and so um in order to combat climate change we're now pursuing certain policies uh, related to renewable energy that um really taxes um especially remote communities um greatly because they're located in resource rich areas um, and indigenous communities who are um, that are located in resource rich areas. So, so there's a conflict here and and um, not really considering how certain policy decisions are influencing the bigger picture and impacting on the bigger picture, I think is is somewhat problematical. And um, and I think if we could maybe look at the world a little differently um, through more of a systems view. Um, we might um, come up with different solutions, policy and otherwise. Definitely. Thank you, Karina. We have a question from Yanis in the chat. Um, referring back to the first question, I wonder if it's climate change or capitalist practices that are causing the loss of land and water. Climate change seems to be a small part of the equation when pitted against capitalist land and resource practices. Um, Yanis, is that, would you like to, would like um, our presenters to answer this statement, to comment on the statement, sorry? Okay, maybe in the meanwhile, we can, uh, uh, we can ask Hugo, because he has, a, he has his hands raised. Hugo, do you have a question? Oh yeah, I do have a question, and it's for Camille. So did you rather ask in French or in English? Uh, 
en français. In French. Parfait. Euh, je vais quand même utiliser les termes euh, anglophones, je les trouve plus simples. Mais euh, tu as parlé de l'inégalité des, des pays euh, face à l'action climatique. Moi, ce que je me questionnais, c'est, je pense qu'il est assez reconnu, la taxe carbone qui est assez intéressante à appliquer. Toutefois, ça amène ce qu'on appelle le « carbon leakage ». Puis, pour régler le carbon leakage, j'ai ce qu'on appelle les ajustements à la frontière, car carbon border adjustment, qui a été mis de l'avant. Euh, mais ça, ça, ça ferait un impact surtout sur les pays en voie de développement euh, qui ont justement, par exemple, pas des, gr des grids encore très renouvelables et qui n'ont peut-être pas la richesse pour se permettre d'avoir une taxe carbone. Fait que, bref, je, je me demandais c'était quoi ta vision sur ça. Enfin, j'ai un peu l'impression que c'est un impératif pour le Canada et l'Union européenne est déjà en train d'appliquer le carbon border adjustment. Pardon, et vous voulez le point de la fin de la question? Que, que penses-tu euh, des Carbon Border Adjustments, des ajustements à la frontière carbone, euh, des Climate Club, qu'on appelle, euh, dans une optique d'équité entre les, entre les pays? Ah, D'accord. Bon, et, et cet ajustement qu'il faut faire, c'est par rapport et à la contribution et des pays, de, de chaque groupe de pays. Vous savez que les pays riches, ils sont plus polluants et, et, et donc les pays pauvres et les pays en développement, ils sont en retard, puisqu'ils sont en retard dans les programmes de développement, ils, ils polluent moins. Donc, il faut ajuster la taxe par rapport et à la contribution ou à, aux émissions que produit chaque groupe de pays et dans les émissions globales. C'est-à-dire qu'on taxe et le niveau de taxe est à fixer dans chaque pays selon les, les niveaux d'émissions que ce pays émet et, et sa part d'émissions dans l'émission dans globale qui réchauffe la planète. So we have a question from the audience. Uh, it's about what Camille just said. So, uh, Est-ce qu'on doit prendre en compte l'empreinte le, historique des pays dans ce calcul-là ou pas? du calcul, mais je pense qu'il faut le faire parce que et le problème, c'est qu'il y a des, des effets irréversibles et dans, et dans, la, et dans le réchauffement climatique. Et que plus un, un pays a émis plus et plus longtemps, et bien plus il y a eu un, un effet qui, qui est peut-être irréversible, qu'il a déjà causé et dans le cadre du réchauffement climatique. Donc, je pense qu'il faut tenir compte des, des, des missions historiques des, des, des pays. OK. So maybe I can translate. Uh, so what I ask is was uh, should we take into account the uh, historical footprint of each uh, country? And the answer was yes because the, uh, there is some uh, irreversibilities in the uh, impact of climate change that must be taken into account. Thank you so much, Camille. Uh, any other questions? Corina wrote in the chat that we should not forget about trends in population growth and urbanization. Corina, would you like to elaborate more on that? Um, sure, I I can, but but I think it goes back to the point I made earlier. It's it's not a dichotomy here between, or the, the discourse shouldn't be about necessarily climate change, capitalism. I mean, they're all factors that all um, drive, I think, a lot of decision making. But but they're also the real factors, the, the trends that we see in urbanization, for example, and population growth. Um, and um, for society to kind of catch up to that um, and figure out um, wh what to do um, that and, and do it sustainably, I think we still have such a long way to go. Um, but I think it's kind of, 
I think it's it's a little bit misguided sometimes to be harping on one issue or the other. It is it is. I think we need to uh, we need to really look at this in a much more comprehensive manner. That's just my two cents on that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone anyone else? Uh, go ahead, Lucy. Uh, hi. Um, thanks for your presentation. I have a question for. Uh, the presenters that studies community uh, communities, um, I was wondering because in um, I see a lot of time, I, I say most of time communities are very vulnerable in terms of um, the introduction of extractive parties that are from outside. And uh, we've talked earlier of how to get uh, communities voice heard. Um, I was wondering, like, if from your literature or from your own experience, have you seen anything that comes out as a useful or efficient tool that comes out from community themselves um, against these uh, extractive um, parties that may alter the local environment? Thank you. Who wants to answer? In my own research, I have not directly come across something um, like maybe successful movements in response to what you said, but I'm sure there must uh, be many. But what I noticed is that talking of extractive industries, you know, so most times these communities are so vulnerable, like they are so vulnerable that what is usually sold to them is only the goods, you know? You don't get to hear the bats. And then maybe they get to accept this purported good you've sold to them. So I think the onus is more on the extractive industries, the um, dominant uh, political system that maybe we talk about extraction, extraction growth, you know, to think back. And also on us, um, based on our privilege as researchers to, to um, kind of take a more holistic view. Corinna talked earlier about uh, a systems approach, and I would uh, add to that maybe a life cycle assessment. So now we're talking of maybe transition, we are talking of cutting down on fossil fuels, which are very laudable goals. But then these alternatives we have now, we must really think very, very holistically. Think what happens, like kind of take a cradle to grave approach, you know maybe we we'll support maybe electric vehicles, everything, but then most of them see what's happening in Congo, maybe indigenous communities will have to go out there and extract. So while we embrace these things, the transition is um, called for, but we should kind of take a balanced look, right? Really think, because most times a lot of things are not apparent to us on the first look. And by the time we get to know, it is too late. So now we're talking of, oh, we're, Based on existential crisis, um, there's a code rate for humanity. But on along, it wasn't like that. And it's not like this research didn't exist, you know, but it's just that it wasn't maybe apparent to the general public or maybe what we know now. So we must take a very critical approach. And even if communities welcome these things, we have to question what do they know? What is being sold to them? Do they really have the knowledge to make a sustainable decision? So that's my own um, in input. Thank you, Adako. Anyone else would like to uh, add on top? Yana, go ahead. Yeah, I um, I agree with everyone um, who said before me. Um, especially, for example, in my own community, uh, we were able to see how mining corporations manipulated um, in order to get a consent. Um, but something that it was very helpful for us, it was um, the organization that every community has. Um, but what happened if the um, indigenous leaders are co-opted by mining corporations because that happened in many communities as well. Um, and also we, some communities started working with nonprofit organization, but sometimes it, uh, the nonprofit organization is not directly working with the community, but sometimes indirectly working with a mining corporation. It's very complex. Um, and so there is less trust 
now from indigenous communities sometimes uh, that happen. So, uh, for example, in my community, what we value a lot is uh, students who can, who want to do research. I think that is the collaboration that we are starting because sharing knowledge because um, most of these uh, communities has the traditional uh, water, uh, the traditional form of water management. And often um, they were marginalized. And that's why basically I do also, I teach Quechua because uh, or even our language, it was marginalized. We were prohibited to speak Quechua in our own community. So now in just uh, two decades, those um, rapid changes is happening in my community. I, I was able to see just uh, in two decades, so much change. So that's why I, I think um, it will be uh, great to work with community and understand the cosmovision of the community. What, when we talk about development, what is development from the perspective of these communities? Um, it, it's sometimes that we don't include in these uh, policies, which is just a top-down top down approach, but we don't really um, uh, looking like how this community's perception actually is about, uh, about what is important for them. Even as I was um, talking with my, uh, doing interview in my community, we don't have even the word in Quechua about poverty, for example. The same mean poverty is not the same that we understand what is poverty. So I think those issues are important and link that with education. I think the only way um, to change that in, the, in this community, critical education is important. Um, to learn about our history is very important. That is, I, I would say, and, and I am, for example, welcome to, um, I, I was, I am asking to students who want to do research, we are, I was from my region, we are very open because I think we can work, we can do something, we need to exchange knowledge and be sensitive about indigenous knowledge as well. But yeah, that that is everything I can say. Thank you. Uh, we are running out of time. So if someone wants to have, when has the last question or wants to uh, comment. I would have a last question, Go which um, I guess would be more direct to that Camille, but also applies to uh, everyone else on this uh, thematic block. So uh, my understanding of your research, Kami, is that basically the results are that um, poverty is affected more, poor people are affected more uh, during the climate transition through market mechanisms. Um, and so my, my question is basically, and you've kind of hinted towards an answer, but um, the question is, do, do you think that the current economic system uh, is able to, there are way to, ways to navigate out of poverty for uh, low-income countries and thus uh, make this problem of uh, a poor countries being more affected during the climate transition go away? Or do you think that the current economic system is not able to navigate that and that it's like a systemic problem? And this question, I guess, applies to uh, everyone on this panel. Est-ce que je, je devrais euh, la poser en, en français ou ça va? Non, ça va, j'ai compris. Okay. Bon, et le, le problème des pays pauvres, bon, il y a quand même un avantage pour, pour les pays les plus pauvres et dans la transition, c'est que aujourd'hui la plupart des pays pauvres, ils achètent et les carburants sur les marchés internationaux. Alors que quand il y a transition, il y a possibilité de produire chez soi et, et les, des, des biocarburants à partir des, des, des intrants qui viennent de, de l'agriculture ou des intrants industriels. Donc il y a possibilité selon les niveaux ou bien d'innovation et qu'on qu peut atteindre et à travers et, le pauvre économique et pour faire en sorte que les pays pauvres peuvent et, et tirer les, un bon parti et dans la transition énergétique. Mais ça va être sur le long terme, à mon sens. Thank you, Camille. Anyone else? 
Okay, I'll just quickly add because my understanding of that question is if the current economic system, like if it would support the change that is needed, yeah? Is that yeah. is it possible to achieve the changes with the current um, economic yeah. system? Yes. Yeah, yeah I, I'll, I'll just... So we need to rethink what this means, what is the cost for us, what's the cost for sustainability. Like, you could grow to where, then what happens tomorrow? So we need a shift in thinking what is important to us, what should we focus our energy more on? So I think change is certainly needed. Thank you, Adako. Uh, anyone else? Karina? So I'm, I'm not an expert in uh, economics, um, so I'd be curious um, to um, know, and maybe somebody else in the audience can answer that, but under SDG 17, um, there are lots of different um, targets that are geared toward ensuring that the current economic system support um, nations um, in uh, to essentially assist nations to get caught up, quote unquote, um, as far as um, sustainable development, uh, reaching sustainable development goals. So um, how do we uh, how do we see that happening? It, it seems to be predicated on the current economic system. So I'd be curious in whether somebody had some views on that as to um, how would the economic system, how could it be changed and still um, ensure that um, the financial means are available to assist those countries um, that are um, like the poorer countries essentially. So, sorry, um, if we have time to answer that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Karina. All right, uh, Jana, would you like to uh, conclude? Do you have something else to 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 add on that? Sorry, uh, my internet is bad, but the question is for me. Is, um, it's a question well, for everyone in case you... you can have you repeat, please? Etienne, would you mind to repeat, please? Sorry. Yes, so the question is basically, is the current economic system able to uh, kind of uh, raise poor countries out of poverty and uh, basically alleviate the issue where poor countries are affected much more by climate change and by the climate transition. So is it possible to do that within the current economic system or does the system have to change? Yeah, this is very complicated. Uh, question that I can respond <laughs> in a couple minutes, but I, I would say that um, I think the structural aspect uh, is very important. Um, I would say like the key aspect is the agency, um, to hear the agency of communities and from the society. Um, and I think you, the key is to change the education system that we have. Um, for example, in Peru, at least in my community, we have um, the kind of education, the curriculum is uh, dictated by the government and no base in the community. What we want to learn in our communities about our histories, about how we were uh, doing land management. So, but we have this top-down approach and, and those approaches sometimes even in the curriculum uh, in, the, in the nation, sometimes it's from the international perspective, right? It's trying to copy whatever developing country is, is doing. So, uh, so I, will, I will bring the, um, I think some of the solution is, uh, has to come from the community itself. But I think I, I, I still have the hope that um, in the current system, we can do some changes. Um, I think it's small changes that we are doing from, com from community in different communities, I think that matters. Thank you. Thank you for such a wonderful conclusion, such a hopeful one. 
Uh, it was a fruitful discussion. Uh, thank you, everyone, for um, your question, for presenting, for your questions, for attending. It was a pleasure to have you here. And now we will move on to a fantastic workshop organized by. Let me make sure that I not misspell the name. Jana Frenzel and Alex Pache. Uh, they are going to have the workshop on keep up with your audience. Please stay with us. Alex will now tell you a bit more. Yeah, if you're willing to stay with us, we're just going to be on the other side of of the the screen here, and we'll work around the table. Um, it'll be fun, laid back, little practice workshop for practicing your skills. And uh, you're welcome to attend online as well. And uh, we hope to see you there. We'll start in maybe five minutes. Thanks.